Hi, this is John Maxwell, and I am delighted to read my book, The 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication. Apply them and make the most of your message. This book is dedicated to John Farrikhan. For 25 years, you and Carla have been helping me in Latin America. You, John, are a leader of leaders, communicator extraordinaire, builder of teams, caster of vision, and an incredible friend. You, Carla, and Susie have expanded my calling to transform nations beyond anything I ever could have imagined. I can never thank you enough. When I began to write the 16 Laws of Communication, I decided to put them into four categories in this book. The first category is who says it, the communicator. What is said is the second category. How it is said is category number three, when it is said, and then finally, why it is said. Introduction Everyone has a message. What do you want to say? Will you be able to deliver that message? When you do, will you communicate well enough that it gets through and accomplishes what you want it to? Everyone has a message. It may be a message for the moment or a message of a lifetime. You may need to communicate the vision for your company or want to speak at the PTA meetings at your child's school or while your high school or college classmates with a great presentation or present the quarterly report without putting your colleagues to sleep or present a product or run for office or preach a sermon or make your living by becoming a professional speaker, or maybe you just want to be able to share your heart with members of a small group. If you desire to share any kind of message, you want to be able to communicate it well. You want to be able to make the most of your message. Can you? According to Harvard Business Review, the number one criteria for advancement and promotion for professionals is an ability to communicate effectively. It is also vital to our everyday life. Communication is how we influence others. It's essential to developing and maintaining relationships. It's the heart of our social activity. Research analyst and communication expert Haley Hawthorne says, Communication is the connective tissue between humans, holding the potential to bring us together create shared understanding, align on and execute initiatives, and so much more. At the end of the day, communication is the vehicle for transformation. Yet at the same time, public speaking, which I define as communicating a message to a group of two or more people, intimidates a lot of people. In one of his routines, stand-up comedian Jerry Seinfeld said, I saw a study that said speaking in front of a crowd is considered to be the number one fear of the average person. I found that amazing. Number two was death. Death? Number two, this means to the average person, if you have to be at a funeral, you'd rather be in the casket than doing the eulogy. It doesn't have to be that way. I believe most of the people who fear communicating to a group of people avoid doing it because they don't want to do it poorly. They worry that they will fail. I know this because in 2011, I founded the Maxwell Leadership Team, a company that trains people as coaches and speakers. When people come to receive their training, they're required to deliver a five-minute message to a small group of fellow trainees at their table. Every person giving their talk wants to do well. They have a message that they want to deliver, and they're anxious to learn how to be effective communicators but they're never as good as they could be. That's why we train them. When it comes to communication, everyone stumbles in the beginning. I've spoken more than 13,000 times in my speaking career, and I'm currently at the top of my game. But my first experience speaking in public, oh my gosh, it was terrible. You'll hear about it in the book. Why wasn't I any good? Because nobody's good the first time. Like anything else, Speaking has a learning curve, but if you have solid principles to guide your growth, you can improve quickly, and every time you speak, you get better. 
As Haley Hawthorne said, Mastering communication skills isn't something that can be done overnight. Developing communication skills is a journey that takes time. But I can tell you this, the journey is worth every step. I've written the 16 Undeniable Laws of Communication to help anyone give a talk to others. Just as I work to help people with leadership, teamwork, and personal growth with my other Laws books, I want to help you with communication with this one. And what was true of those laws of leadership, teamwork, and growth are also true with these. Number one, the laws can be learned. Some are easier to understand and apply than others, but everyone can be acquired. Number two, the laws can stand alone. Each law complements all the others, but you don't need to know one to learn another. Number three, the laws carry consequences with them. Apply the laws, and you will make the most of your message and increase your influence. Violate or ignore them, and you will not be effective in communicating to others. Number four, the laws are timeless. Whether you're young or old, experienced or inexperienced, the laws apply just the same. They apply to your grandparents, and they're going to apply to your great-grandchildren. Number five, the laws are the foundation of good communication. Once you learn the principles, you will have to practice them and apply them to your life. If you do, you will become a better communicator. Billionaire businessman and philanthropist Warren Buffett said, The one easy way to become worth 50% more than you are now, at least, is to hone your communication skills, both written and verbal. He also said, If you can't communicate, it's like winking at a girl in the dark. Nothing happens. You can have all the brain power in the world, but you have to be able to transmit it. And that transmission is communication. Whether you want to lead a business, teach a class, sell a product, preach a sermon, train a staff member, coach a team, earn a degree, run a nonprofit, or speak at a neighborhood meeting, learning to communicate better will help you. Learn and apply the laws of communication, and you will make the most of your message, and that will help you succeed in everything that you do. Law number one, the law of credibility. Your most effective message is the one that you live. What would have happened if the I Have a Dream speech during the March on Washington in 1963 had been delivered by segregationist Governor George Wallace instead of Martin Luther King, Jr., or if the Gettysburg Address in 1863 had been made by Jefferson Davis, President of the Confederacy, instead of Abraham Lincoln, or if the Sermon on the Mount had been preached not by Jesus Christ, but by Judas Iscariot or Pontius Pilate. How would the people listening have responded? Would they have rioted? Would they have attacked the speaker? Would they have simply walked away? At the very least, their messages would have fallen flat, and their words would have been forgotten. Why? Because the noble, inspiring, memorable, life-impacting words in those messages would not have matched the people who spoke them. When it comes to communication, a disconnection like that doesn't work because your most effective message is the one that you live. Anything else is just empty words, and that is the law of credibility. The first law of communication is not more important than others, but there is still a reason why it's first. As a communicator, if you don't learn and live this law, the others won't help you much. Who you are gives credibility to everything that you say. As my friend Jamie Kern Lima, the founder of It Cosmetics, says in her book Believe It, authenticity doesn't automatically guarantee success, but inauthenticity guarantees failure. If you speak words you do not live, you lack authenticity, and your communication will never be successful. The law of connecting, which is in chapter 7, teaches that communication is all about others. Your focus should be on your audience. While that's true, communication doesn't begin with your audience. It begins with you. 
That's true of everyone who wants to become a good communicator. The relationship that we have with ourselves determines the relationship we will have with others. If you don't accept who you are, if we are uncomfortable with ourselves, if we don't know our own strengths and weaknesses, if we aren't authentic, then the attempts that we make to connect with others will misfire. Once we know ourselves, like ourselves, feel comfortable with ourselves and act true to ourselves, then we are capable of knowing others, liking them, feeling comfortable with them, and being authentic with them. The Qualities of a Credible Communicator To know and become your authentic self with others and communicate with credibility, you need to do five things. Number one, be transparent. Communication is more than just sharing information. It's really about sharing yourself, your real self. That level of honesty is the key to being able to connect with people. Brene Brown, in her book, The Gifts of Imperfection, says, Authenticity is a collection of choices that we have to make every day. It's about the choice to show up and be real, the choice to be honest, the choice to let our true self be seen. It can feel like a risk to be authentic and transparent. People might not like the real you, but they might not like the phony version of you either. And if they did initially like the inauthentic version, when they found out it wasn't really you, they wouldn't like that either. Wouldn't you prefer to be liked or disliked for who you really are? I know I would. People don't want perfect communicators, but they do want authentic ones. Speakers who are open and real in their communication are attractive because they share their failures as well as their successes. They can be honest and direct while still being empathetic toward others. It takes courage to be transparent, and people admire that in communicators, especially when those speakers value their listeners. Nobel Prize-winning novelist John Steinbeck said, A man's writing is himself. A kind man writes kindly. A mean man writes meanly. A wise man writes wisely. When people are authentic, both their writing and their speaking reflect who they really are. If you want to know me, read my books or listen to me speak. I stopped trying to project an image or be someone I wasn't in my early 20s. Since then, I've never tried to be someone other than my imperfect self. That commitment was tested when I started writing books early in my 30s. My publisher cautioned me about a few things he believed would hurt the sales of my books. I wanted to write to leaders. He said that would greatly limit my audience. I love lists and numbers, and I like putting them in my books. The publisher again said readers don't like that and recommended that I stop using them. I seriously considered changing my style to please my publisher, but in the end I decided that I needed to be who I was. My calling is to help leaders. My gifting is teaching leadership. I think in lists, outlines, and numbers. I decided to write the books that I believed I should write, even if it meant reaching fewer people. As it turned out, more people than they expected connected with my message and my style. And more than 40 years later, I'm still writing what I love based on who I am. Number two, be consistent. Mark Batterson says almost anybody can accomplish almost anything if they work at it long enough, hard enough, and smart enough. What he's really talking about is consistency. Since the best predictor of what a person will do today is what he did yesterday, a solid pattern of consistency gives a person credibility. What you repeatedly do tells others who you are. When you first begin communicating with people, they don't yet know if you're consistent. Usually, they take what you say at face value. Your words carry weight because people aren't familiar with your actions. Over time, what you say carries less weight and what you do carries more. Nothing is easier than saying words and nothing is harder than living them day after day. If you give good advice but set a bad example, you confuse and eventually lose your audience. Consistency is crucial 
if you want to become a good communicator. For more than 50 years, I've been intentional about adding value to people. That's my motivation for writing, speaking, and building relationships with others. I see every day as an opportunity to rededicate myself to helping people, and a good day for me is when I do things that improve the lives of others. When I step onto a stage and say, My name is John, and I'm your friend. People who are familiar with my history know that I want to help them, but this takes time. Good work must be stored up before it shows up. Consistency compounds. So does credibility. It may take time, but it always has a return. Number three, be a good example. Have you ever been working on writing a message and you found some material that seemed good or interesting? but you couldn't verify it through your own experience or observation. That is, it was really someone else's advice, not your own. Did you use it? Early in my career as a leader and a speaker, I would. But it didn't set right with me. After doing this several times, I made an important decision. I would not teach anything I did not wholeheartedly believe. Making that choice gave my delivery great conviction. A few years later, I decided to take that decision one step further. I would not teach anything I was not trying to live. That choice added greater credibility to my conviction because it committed me to being an example of what I taught. As James Cousins and Barry Posner say, the truth is that you either lead by example or you don't lead at all. Seeing is believing and your constituents have to see you living out the standards you set and the values you profess. Roddy Galbraith, who has taught more than 40,000 Maxwell Leadership Certified Team Coaches how to speak effectively, gives this advice to new speakers to help them choose material. 1. Relive what you have learned, allowing your audience to relive it with you. 2. Earn the audience's respect by sharing your wins and gain their love by sharing your failures. Three, decide what you shall speak on by choosing what you have lived out. Following this advice helps give these new speakers the credibility they need. There's a story told of Mahatma Gandhi in which a woman took her little boy to see the great leader. Mahatma, please tell my little boy to stop eating sugar, the woman requested. Come back in three days, said Gandhi. In three days, the woman and the little boy returned, and Gandhi said to the little boy, Stop eating sugar. Puzzled, the woman asked, But why was it necessary for us to return after three days? Couldn't you have told my boy to stop eating sugar when he first visited? I could not tell him that then, said Gandhi, because three days ago I was also eating sugar. This story illustrates the point that being a good example brings credibility to one's words. When somebody gives good advice but sets a bad example, it creates confusion. That's why Ralph Waldo Emerson said, What you are stands over you, and thunders so that I cannot hear what you say to the contrary. When words and actions don't line up for a speaker, he not only confuses the audience, he loses the audience. Number four. Be competent. My favorite hobby is golf, and one of my highlights has been playing in the AT&T Pro-Am Tournament at Pebble Beach. It's so much fun being paired with a professional golfer and playing the course. My brother asked me if I was nervous playing in front of a big crowd, and I said, Oh, not at all. None of those people came to see me play. My golf game can be summed up by something that happened one day when I was playing golf with my friend Ron Simmons. I was playing my usual game, which would put my score in the mid-80s, when I hit a long, beautiful drive. I looked at Ron and asked, why can't I do that every time? Because you're not any good, he immediately answered, and we both laughed because it was true. Now, why do I bring this up? Because nobody has ever asked me to speak on the subject of golf. Why? Because I'm not competent in that area nor have I ever been asked to speak or write about music appreciation, technology, or archaeology. I have no credibility in those areas. What I'm asked to speak and write about are leadership, 
personal growth, success. The weight of a communicator's words is determined by what they have accomplished. Where have you been successful? What skills have you acquired and used that you can pass on to others? You cannot give what you do not have. If you have not yet developed high competence in an area of your life that you want to teach about, then begin by working on that area and learning. Become great at what you do and then teach out of the overflow of your life. Competent people earn the right to speak into the lives of others. Number five, be trustworthy. I mentioned Mahatma Gandhi while talking about being a good model, and many other stories about him shed light on the qualities that gave him credibility as a speaker. One was his trustworthiness, which he proved time and again. One such example occurred in South Africa at the turn of the 20th century. Gandhi had moved there as a young man in 1893 to work as an attorney for the owner of a shipping business. When that job ended, he decided to stay to fight for the rights of Indians there because he and many others had suffered racism and abuse. In 1904, the pneumonic plague broke out among the Indian population in Johannesburg. Gandhi came to the people's aid and rallied support, even creating a makeshift hospital in a warehouse to care for them. But the local government decided to take drastic measures to keep the disease from spreading They intended to burn the village where the plague broke out. It was during this time that the people's trust in Gandhi was proven. In his autobiography, he wrote, The decision was to make the whole location's population vacate and live under canvas for three weeks in an open plain about 13 miles from Johannesburg and then to set fire to the location where they had lived. The people were in terrible fright but my constant presence was a consolation to them. Many of the poor people used to hoard their scanty savings underground. This had to be unearthed. They had no bank. They knew none. I became their banker. Streams of money poured into my office. So far as I can remember, nearly 60,000 pounds were thus deposited. The location's residents were removed by spatial train to Clipsfruit Farm near Johannesburg. The location was put to the flames on the very next day after its evacuation. The accumulated wealth of that entire group of people was put into Gandhi's hand because they trusted him. He had established his credibility long before he needed it. As a result, he was able to help people. They were willing to move, and further deaths from the plague were averted. Trust is a person's greatest asset. When you have established your trustworthiness, People know you possess good motives, that you genuinely want to help others, and people can sense it. Trustworthiness makes leaders and communicators effective because people listen to them, believe what they say, and cooperate with them. Without trust, everything grinds to a halt. Why do you desire to speak to others? What is your motivation? Are you genuinely there for the audience to advance their cause? or? Are you doing it for yourself, to advance your career, promote your business, get a book deal, become famous? Those motives may not be wrong, but none of them builds trust. First and foremost, you must speak to benefit others. If you struggle with this law, the law of connecting, chapter 7, and the law of adding value, chapter 15, will help you. As you work to gain credibility as a speaker, Your influence with others will grow, and it will likely happen in a predictable way. In my book, The Five Levels of Leadership, I discuss how leaders gain influence step by step. My longtime friend Dan Ryland, Executive Director of Leadership Expansion at the Maxwell Leadership Center, took the stages from the five levels of leadership and adapted them to teach communication. I want to share his lesson with a few changes and additions of my own. Think about your credibility with the various groups of people to whom you speak to identify where you are with them. The first level is what I call the requirement level. People have to listen. When I was 22, I became the pastor of a very small country church in southern Indiana. I started with no experience preaching. I was young and green and had not yet built any relationships. 
But the people who attended services listened to my sermons. Why? Because I had the position of a pastor. Now, it didn't take me long to realize that relying on position to get people to listen is the lowest level of speaking. There was nothing wrong with beginning at that level. That's where most of us start. But if you want to become a good communicator, you can't stay at that level. I recognized this, and I made an important decision. I would work to improve my speaking. I would try to become bigger and better than my position. We've all had the experience of listening to someone speak because we were required to. Maybe you've listened to a boss because you wanted to keep your job, or you listened to a teacher or professor because you wanted to pass a class, or to a government official who was the gatekeeper for a process you needed to complete. You listen because the person had a position that demanded it, and you didn't have much of a choice. If you want to become a good communicator, you must acknowledge that your position or title will not keep people engaged. You need to raise the bar for yourself and start developing skills that make others want to listen to you. That brings us to the next level. Number two, the relationship level. People want to listen because they like you. Within a few months at that first church I pastored, I developed relationships with people. I liked them, and they liked me. And I could sense a shift in them from having to listen to me to wanting to listen to me. Was it because my speaking had improved greatly? I doubt it. But my relationship with them had. This confirmed the truth of the old saying, people do not care how much you know until they know how much you care. I discovered that communication was more than just speaking. It was relating to people. If you speak regularly to the same people, the best thing you can do is develop good relationships with them. If you're in situations where you can't develop individual relationships, then be relational. Care about your listeners as people. Be transparent and authentic and live what you speak and people will like you. Number three, the remarkable level. People like to listen because you're good. As a young speaker, when I sensed that my audience liked me and wanted to hear me, I became more motivated to improve as a communicator and give them even more reasons to want to listen. This is when I accepted the challenge of learning to become a good communicator. I estimated that it took me about eight years to find, develop, and refine my style. This may sound like a long time, but it was worth the effort. Was I done learning at that point? No. I didn't stop then, and I still haven't. I've been speaking for more than 50 years, but I continue to learn and grow. Being a good communicator is a journey, not a destination. Dan calls this level of communication remarkable with good reason, because it makes a person stand out. You can achieve this level only with dedication. It takes a lot of time and effort to become remarkable. If you get to this level of communication, people take notice and tell others because it's so unusual. I want to pause here for a moment to encourage you. I want you to become remarkable, and I believe you can be. That's why the rest of this book is dedicated to teaching you principles and skills that will help you on your communication journey. And as you learn the laws and put them into practice, your speaking skills will improve. My best advice to you is to stay hungry and to learn. Be like the little boy at the fair who wanted to buy a huge cone of cotton candy. The vendor took one look at him and said, That's a lot of cotton candy for a little boy like you. Oh, don't worry, the boy replied. I'm bigger on the inside than on the outside. If you have already been working on your communication, then the laws in this book can help you fill any holes in your ability and help you fine-tune your skills. If you're new to communication, it may take you quite some time to become remarkable, but you can do it. These laws will jumpstart your learning. Number four, the reason level. People seek to listen because you add value to their lives. I've already mentioned the importance of a speaker's motivation. In his book, Start With Why, Simon Sinek says people don't buy what you do, 
they buy why you do it. He wrote that in the context of leadership, but it's just as important in communication. The reason I started speaking and writing was to help people. My desire was to add value to them. But there's a difference between wanting to add value to people and succeeding in adding value. It took me time and energy to figure out how to add value. It took the earning of credibility to deliver on that desire. I want to share with you what that process looked like for me because I believe it will help you too. I had to find myself. I found myself when I stopped trying to be like anyone else. I had to know myself. I knew myself when I examined myself and asked myself questions and gave honest answers. I had to be myself. I became myself when I accepted the way that God made me. I had to improve myself. I improved myself when I consistently developed my speaking skills through trial and error. I had to get over myself. I got over myself when I stopped focusing on myself and how I looked to others. And finally, I had to give myself. I gave myself when I started thinking about others and how I could help them. As you work to become a better communicator, embrace each of these lessons. They will help make you someone capable of adding value to people. Number five, the return level. People are eager to listen because who you are. There is one final level of influence a person can reach as a communicator. Dan labeled this the return level because the speaker's lifetime of work improving his craft, focusing on others and adding value to them, creates an extraordinary return on investment. At this point, people listen because of who you are and what you've done over a long period of time. This is the ultimate level of credibility for a speaker, and it comes from having moral authority. Moral authority can be difficult to describe, but you know it when you see or hear it. A story told by Terry Pierce in Leading Out Loud about English actor Charles Lachlan, famous for his readings of poetry and other literary passages, illustrates exactly what I mean. Sir Charles was attending a Christmas party with a large family in London. Well into the evening, the host decided that each person in attendance should read or recite a favorite passage, one that reminded them most of the spirit of Christmas. Lawton's turn came near the end, and he recited in his beautifully trained voice the 23rd Psalm. Everyone applauded his effort, and the process continued. Within minutes, all had participated except one elderly aunt who had dozed off in the corner of the room. She was particularly loved, and they gently woke her, explained what was going on, and asked her to take part. She thought for a moment, and then she began in her shaky voice, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The room hushed. She continued. And when she finished, tears were dripping down every face. Upon leaving, one of the younger members of the family thanked Lawton for coming and remarked about the difference in the response of the family to the two readings, in one case appreciation, in the other deep connection and involvement. How do you account for it? asked the young man, shaking his head. Lawton looked at him and replied simply, I know the psalm. She knows the shepherd. As you learn and grow as a communicator, Working on your skills and techniques, never stop working on improving yourself on the inside. Good communicators know themselves, connecting with themselves, and accept themselves. You can do this by connecting with your thoughts, which help you prepare your content, your feelings, which inspire the delivery of your content, and your actions, which give credibility to your content. Every time you prepare to speak, ask yourself, is this something I know? Is this something I feel? Is this something I do? Look for a yes to all three questions and work to keep those things in alignment. You are the message you speak. If what you're preparing to deliver doesn't connect with you, it won't connect with others. It won't breathe life into others if it doesn't live in you. Why? Because your most effective message is the one that you live. And that, my friend, 
is the law of credibility. Let me just give you, uh, for a couple of minutes, my personal thoughts about the law of credibility. When I was writing chapter one for you, I began to think of my own life and how that speaking was more difficult in the beginning than it is today. Obviously, 50 years of experience and speaking over 13,000 times has certainly helped the cause. But there's a, a deeper, more meaningful reason about the improvement of communication that I just don't want you to miss, and that's why I wrote chapter one on the law of credibility. The longer I have lived out my life, the principles that I have lived have become who I am. And when they become who you are and you speak them out of who you are, not what you know or what you have heard or even what you think, it begins to carry with it what I call moral weight. Moral weight is when people hear not only what you're saying, but they feel the depth of it, and it speaks to their heart, and it resonates and gives them a desire not only to listen to what you say, but to follow what you say. Of course, I've spent my time teaching leaders and developing leadership in the lives of so many people. But when I found that the law of credibility carries moral authority, and that when I speak because I've had experienced this, because I now have lived through the highs and the low of it, that's when the moral weight is carried. It's going to take time, takes experience, and so therefore you must be patient. But here's what I want you to know. Never underestimate who you are becoming and never stop sharing that journey because it's in the journey of your ups and downs and your learning and your hits and your misses that just allows your words to resonate and speak to the heart of people. Remember this, when people hear you, when people listen to you, they may listen with their ears, but they understand with their heart. The law of credibility not only goes in the ears, but it goes straight to the heart. Law number two, the law of observation. Good communicators learn from great communicators. How does any person learn to communicate to an audience? Hall of Fame baseball player Yogi Berra, who became better known for his catchy sayings than he did for catching in games with the Yankees, said, You can observe a lot by just watching. That is the essence of the law of observation. Good communicators learn from great communicators. The Wisdom of Watching A few years ago, I came across a joke that I love. A fox, a wolf, and a bear went hunting, and each got a deer. A discussion followed about how to divide the spoils. The bear asked the wolf how he thought it should be done, and the wolf said, Everyone should get one deer. Suddenly, the bear ate the wolf. Then the bear asked how the fox proposed to divvy things up. The fox offered the bear his deer and then said the bear ought to take the wolf's deer as well. Where did you get such wisdom, asked the bear. <laughs> From the wolf, replied the fox. Like all communicators, I got my start by watching others speak and learning lessons from them. For me, it began early because my father was a preacher. Many Sundays as a child, I heard my dad communicate a sermon to the church. He spoke with great passion and what a voice. He was from the generation before amplification. His voice was deep and he could project. My dad was an excellent speaker. I loved listening to him. His greatest strengths were his love for people, his personal credibility, and his great conviction. When I was in the seventh grade, Dad took me to hear Dr. Norman Vincent Peale speak at Veterans Memorial Auditorium in Columbus, Ohio, and that gave me another speaking model to observe and learn from. Dad was a student of Peale and his books, and he practiced the same power of positive thinking philosophy that Peale promoted. 
Peel was upbeat and encouraging, and he told a lot of stories when he spoke. Those qualities became something I identified as important to good communication. In the 50s, you might have been able to hear the President of the United States speak on the radio. But if you wanted an opportunity to hear other great speakers, you had to go see them live. In the Midwest in the 50s and 60s, my family would attend multi-day events called camp meetings where great preachers spoke one after another all day long. Old-fashioned speakers, such as Lawrence B. Hicks, would inspire people in the audience to stand to the feet and clap, shouting amen. I started seriously to study other speakers when I was 18. By then, I knew speaking would be an essential part of my career. Because I would be preaching, I naturally started by observing preachers. I greatly admired the speaking of Charles Williams. He was a brilliant man with a photographic memory, a great orator who used continually flowery phrases. Because he was so skilled, I tried speaking his style. Oh, what a disaster. It was like wearing another man's clothes that didn't fit me. My mindset is more practical than philosophical, and I'd rather be funny than flowery. His way of speaking worked great for him, but not at all for me. When I was in my mid-twenties, I got a chance to be a part of a speaking lineup in Vicksburg, Mississippi, with the legendary preacher named R.G. Lee. He was world-renowned for a message called Payday Someday that he had delivered more than 1,200 times. I had listened to a recording of him delivering that message when I was in college. I knew I was not in his league or the league of any of the other speakers on the program. In fact, when I met Dr. Lee before the event, I was so intimidated by him that I offered to give him my speaking time in the lineup. No, no, son, he said. I'm excited to hear you. When I spoke, he sat in the front row and encouraged me by listening. Afterward, he shook my hand and said, That was a wonderful message. You have a great future. Can I take a picture with you? I couldn't believe he wanted to photograph with me. It was something I would remember later when I met young leaders whom I wanted to encourage. After the photo was taken, he even offered to meet me the next morning for breakfast. Around the same time, I saw Paul Harvey speak, then Cabot Robert, a lawyer and a salesman, who had become a professional public speaker in his early 60s after he won the Golden Gavel Award from Toastmasters International. Robert went on to found the National Speakers Association and promoted keynote speaking as a profession. I also saw Zig Ziglar speak for the first time. He really opened my mind to greater possibilities when it came to communication. Zig made the most of his Southern draw. He recited poetry. He used humor. He moved around on the stage. He asked questions. He interacted with his audience. In the first message I saw him deliver, he used an old-fashioned hand pump as a prop on stage to help make his point. Like a lot of speakers in the 70s, I learned a lot from him and applied what I could to my speaking. By the time I moved to San Diego in 1981, I'd been speaking professionally for 12 years and had learned by observing hundreds of excellent communicators. By then, I thought I was becoming pretty good as a speaker. But it didn't take me long to figure out that the audiences in California were much different than those in the Midwest. I looked around and observed communicators such as Chuck Swindoll, Ray Stedman, Lloyd Ogilvy, and I immediately worked to modify my style, making it more informal, conversational, and relevant. Now, why do I bring up the names of all of those communicators, most of whom you've probably never heard of? To make a point, each of us will have a unique history of observing and learning from other communicators who are better than we are if we want to become good speakers. If you don't already have a history of watching and learning from great speakers, then you had better start now, because good communicators learn from great communicators. That's the law of observation. My Stages of Communication Growth In his 2015 letter to shareholders of Berkshire Hathaway, Warren Buffett wrote, Much of what you become in life depends on whom you choose to admire and copy. Buffett attributes a lot of what he learned about managing companies to Tom Murphy, 
who was his mentor. Murphy built Capital Cities Communications into a telecommunications empire. In 1995, Murphy sold his company, then Capital Cities ABC, to Disney for approximately $19 billion. It took someone who knew how to become a billionaire to teach Buffett how to become a billionaire. Warren Buffett's statement is also true about communicating. Who you will become as a communicator depends on who you choose to admire and copy. As I look back now, I can see that my communication journey proceeded in four stages based on the people who I learned from and how I applied the lesson. Stage 1. I worked to learn the basics of good speaking where I was. My starting place was to look at others within my professional group, in my case within my denomination, and I learned by observing the best speakers. I watched them, learned from them, imitated what I thought would work for me. I spoke as often as I could to get practice. I tried different techniques, failed often, made adjustments, and improved. Stage two, I learned more from great communicators outside my own world. As I became better, I widened my view. I looked at other communicators, professionals such as Zig Ziglar, to learn from them. I also began to observe great communicators from every field and profession. I'll discuss that more in this chapter. Number three, as my audiences changed, I changed to keep connecting with them. The more experience I gained as a communicator, the more tuned in I became to my audience. As I expanded my speaking career, I had to keep learning new ways to connect with people. I will discuss this in great detail in Chapter 7 with the Law of Connecting. Stage number four, I started teaching core principles that everyone could apply. In the 70s, I began teaching leadership. My audience was primarily church leaders. During the 80s and 90s, more and more business people attended my conferences to learn leadership, and I realized I could help more people if I shifted my speaking from church-specific leadership practices to universal leadership principles. This was when the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership was born. This shift meant that I had to reinvent myself again as a speaker, but it was well worth the effort to increase my influence and impact. Today, I continue to study communication so I can learn and grow. I will do that until the day I die. Why? First, because I love communication and want to know everything I can about it, and second, I know there are communicators out there who are better than I am and from whom I can learn. Third, audiences continue to change. If I'm not continuing to grow, one day I'll wake up and find myself irrelevant. I don't want that to happen. Better people make you better. If you have not already begun observing communicators and learning from them, then begin now. If you desire to be a good comedian, watch great comedians and learn from what they do. If you want to become a good trial lawyer, watch great attorneys speak in the courtroom. If you want to become a good classroom teacher, observe great teachers to gain a better understanding of how they teach. If you want to lead a business well, watch great business communicators, cast vision, speak to their employees, or introduce their products. Start wherever you are and then practice your craft. Speak as often as you can and apply what you learn. Use whatever techniques you can imitate, borrow, or steal. Pay attention to what works and what doesn't. Adapt and figure out your own style using whatever works for you. If you start to become good as a communicator in your field, don't stop there. There's an old saying, if you are at the head of the class, you're in the wrong class. To continue growing as a speaker, expand your view of communicators from whom you learn. Watch highly skilled and experienced communicators in every field, and do it with intentionality, not casually. Each time you observe, ask yourself these questions. What did the communicator do to connect? Why did the introduction work so well? What made the structure work? What was the best moment? How did the communicator create it? What made the communication memorable? What was his or her best communication quality? How much was personality and how much was technique? 
what did he or she do, that I can try. That's what I did. I studied communicators from different fields with different skills, and here are some of the things that I learned. I learned intimacy by observing Walter Cronkite. I grew up watching TV's Walter Cronkite, the anchor of CBS Evening News, which he headed from 1962 to 1981. Speaking like an honest fatherly figure, Cronkite was described as the most trusted man in America. During the years he was on the air, he shaped the opinions of the nation as he covered the assassinations of John F. Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Robert F. Kennedy, the Apollo 11 moon landing, Watergate, and the Vietnam War. After Cronkite visited Vietnam and publicly stated the war could end only in a stalemate, President Lyndon Johnson said, If I've lost Cronkite, I've lost Middle America. Some believe this may have convinced Johnson not to run again. What made Cronkite so effective was his ability to create intimacy with viewers. Prior to his broadcast, people were used to getting news by reading newspapers, listening to the radio, hearing the stilted voices of newsreel narrators, or listening to politicians' speeches. But communication in the 60s was changing. Speaker, author, and coach Nick Morgan has written about the shift from public oratory in large spaces to intimate communication. He says, The growing use of microphones and speaker systems allowed for a more physically restrained approach to speaking before large audiences. But the real sea change in speaking styles came later. It is usually attributed to the Kennedy-Nixon presidential debates in 1960, the first to be televised. But in fact, the switch happened in the 1950s as people forsook outdoor speeches and lecture halls for the comfort of the intimate little screen in the living room. Instead of watching a speaker address us from a distant stage, we invited Walter Cronkite into our homes. With the television screen framing his head and shoulders, Cronkite appeared to be talking to us from a few feet away. Within a space, we usually reserved for talk about fairly personal matters with people we trust. The close personal contact, or the illusion of it at least, made us feel connected to Cronkite and other television figures. They became implicitly trustworthy in our minds. In this seemingly intimate space created by television, the old-fashioned kinesthetic approach to public speaking, the large gestures, the sweeping phrases, the grand conceits, was obviously out of place. What we needed instead, and what we got, was the personal conversation appropriate to the cozy environment. Over time, the illusion of physical closeness conveyed by television created in all audiences an expectation of intimacy, both spatial and emotional, from a speaker. Because of television, people expected communication to be more personal conversation. People crave less performance and more intimacy and warmth. As a communicator, I had to find a way to convey that. I've discovered that when I sit on a stool on stage and engage my audience in a more conversational tone, I can create a moment of personal connection with them. And I love that. The moment I sit, I can see the people in the audience get more relaxed. That action has transformed my communication. I learned the value of being natural by observing John F. Kennedy. A lot has been written about the 1960 debate between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. It was the first presidential debate to be televised, and many commentators assert that it changed American politics forever. I remember watching it on television when I was 13 years old and being captivated by Kennedy. While Nixon looked haggard and uncomfortable, Kennedy looked relaxed and youthful with his easy smile and natural delivery. His body language seemed to fit the moment, and his answers were just the right length. Even as a younger teenager, I was able to understand his points and follow his thinking. After Kennedy was elected president, 
Like many young people in our country, I followed him and tried to listen to him communicate whenever I could. One of the things I heard him say that really spoke to me as a teenager was, everyone has a change the world speech in them. Wow, those words planted a desire in my heart that has lasted 60 years. I've been committed to helping people and changing my world through my communication ever since. I learned about timing by observing E.B. Hill. E.B. Hill was a preacher in Los Angeles who had great positive influence in the African-American community. He once invited me to preach in his church, which I considered a great honor. When I watched him preach, I saw that his sense of timing was impeccable. When he came to a very tender part of his message, he would pause. He slowly walked around the side of the lectern to gain connection with his audience, and he would let the auditorium become utterly quiet. Then, with a lowered voice, he would speak with great emotion and gentleness. Everyone was touched by what he said, because he said it in the right way at the right time. He became a model for me. When I physically move on stage, use pauses, and slow down to share something of importance, I use techniques that I observed from E.B. Hill. I learned to do it well, but not as effectively as he did it. He was the master. In the Law of Anticipation, Chapter 9, I will discuss how to use timing when speaking. I learned about clarity by observing Ronald Reagan. When Ronald Reagan was serving as the 40th President of the United States, I used to love watching him speak. Often referred to as the great communicator, Reagan was able to connect with his audience because he chose words that were simple, compelling, and easy to understand. He communicated using simple wisdom and succinct, quotable phrases. For example, we can't help everyone, but everyone can help someone. Peace is not absence of conflict. It's the ability to handle conflict by peaceful means. Recession is when a neighbor loses his job. Depression is when you lose yours. When you can't make them see the light, make them feel the heat. Inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. I've always believed that a lot of trouble in the world would disappear if we were talking to each other instead of about each other. And what we all have heard from him Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Too many speakers try to impress their audience with how clever they are. Reagan tried to impact his audience with how simple his message was. I will discuss this more in The Law of Simplicity, Chapter 10. I learned about projecting confidence by observing Margaret Thatcher. In 1979, Margaret Thatcher became the first woman to serve as British Prime Minister a post that she held until 1990. Nicknamed the Iron Lady, she projected confidence and strength as a leader and a communicator, and she was not afraid to meet the opposition head-on. A chemist by education, she believed that she could come up with a solution to any problem. When she had won her place as Prime Minister, she said, Where there is discord, may we bring harmony. Where there is error, may we bring truth. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith, and where there is despair, may we bring hope. My wife Margaret and I had the privilege to be among a small group who spent an evening with the former prime minister. As she spoke to us, her confidence commanded the attention of everyone in the room. And during an opportunity for us to ask questions, her answers conveyed a strong sense of security. I was reminded of her recently when somebody came up to me after I was speaking and said, When you speak, I feel that all is going to be well. That was such a great compliment because I admired that in Thatcher, and I have attempted to convey security to others when I speak. I learned about believability by observing John Wooden. During the early 2000s, I had the privilege of getting to meet Coach John Wooden a couple of times a year to ask questions and learn from him. I was his fan many decades before I ever got to meet him because he was such a great coach. 
leading the basketball program at UCLA. He won 10 NCAA national championships in 12 years. More importantly, he invested in his players and changed their life. Coach Wooden's integrity, credibility, and trustworthiness were as legendary as his ability to teach and coach. In his book, Wooden on Leadership, he explained his approach and how it impacted his players. Frequent and gratuitous praise removes the great value of a sincere compliment. Leaders who dole it out with little thought sacrifice a most powerful motivational ally, the pat on the back. For example, I avoided the phrase, that's great. Instead, I would say, good, very good, that's getting better, or that's the idea, now you're getting it, good. I kept in mind that how I conveyed information was often as important as the information itself. My tone was measured and my demeanor controlled, and I was honest. When I finally met John Wooden for the first time, one of my first impressions was his trustworthiness. He listened well, spoke carefully, and was sincere. Because I tend to believe the best in everyone and can be generous in my praise, I took note of his demeanor, and it reminded me not to over-communicate positive praise, but instead to follow his example. I learned about using rhythm by observing Martin Luther King, Jr., One of the greatest speakers in my lifetime was Martin Luther King, Jr., and when I was a teenager and he was campaigning for civil rights, I used to hear some of his speaking on the radio and on television. What struck me was the way King used rhythm and pauses to communicate motion and meaning to his audience. David Murray, the founder of Professional Speechwriters Association and the Executive Communication Council, has written about the musical quality of King's speaking. Most song lyrics look dead and dull on a page. In this, I have a dream speech. The best prose is in the first two thirds. But the music starts when King departs from his text, or appears to. He stops talking and he begins to sing. I have a dream that one day, this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. I have a dream that one day, on the red hills of Georgia, the sons of former slaves and the sons of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of brotherhood. I have a dream that one day, even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, swallowing with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. If those words moved you just to hear me say them, it's because your imagination is putting them in Keene's voice, etched in your memory. But let someone say them in a tone-deaf verbal ramble, as we all did in grade school, and you realize how much Keene's rhythm and melody are what made those lines immortal. Delivery isn't all, but it's a lot. In fact, Keene's speech has been analyzed for rhythm and found to be just right to help audiences absorb and comprehend his message. I did not try to imitate King's style, but I learned from him to pay attention to rhythm of my speaking, to speed it up when I wanted to create energy and excitement and to slow it down or stop altogether for emphasis. I will discuss this in greater depth in the Law of Change-Up, Chapter 14. I learned about courage by observing Winston Churchill. Not all the communicators I learned from were active in my lifetime, nor have I heard all of them in person. As I studied World War II, I learned about the communication of Franklin D. Roosevelt, an excellent communicator whose we have nothing to fear but fear itself speech during the Depression, and Day of Infamy speech after the attack on Pearl Harbor moved the nation. But his counterpart across the pond during the war, Winston Churchill, was an even greater communicator. 
Perhaps no leader of the 20th century displayed as much courage in communicating as he did, or understood its importance more. He said, Courage is rightly esteemed the first of human qualities, because, as has been said, it is the quality which guarantees all others. When the entire British establishment sought to appease Hitler before the war, Churchill stood and spoke against the coming Nazi threat. He was proven correct when the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939. With Britain at war with Germany, Churchill became Prime Minister of Great Britain in 1940. In his first speech to the House of Commons as Prime Minister, he delivered one of his most memorable speeches. I would say to the House, as I said to those who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many long months of struggle and of suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I will say, it is to wage war by sea, land, and air, with all our might and with all the strength that God can give us, to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark, lamentable catalog of human crime. This is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word. It is victory. Victory at all cost. Victory in spite of all terror. Victory, however long and hard the road may be. For without victory, there is no survival. Under Churchill's leadership, Britain stood bravely against the Nazis as Germany bombed Britain, relentlessly killing 45,000 civilians in 18 months. He encouraged the people of his nation to be brave, keep calm, and carry on. Not only did he exemplify courage, he wanted every leader in wartime England to exhibit it. Journalist, historian, and author Eric Larson writes that Churchill taught the art of being fearless because he believed confidence and fearlessness were attitudes that could be adopted and taught by example. War Cabinet Secretary Edward Bridges said of Churchill, only he had the power to make the nation believe that it could win. But Churchill himself was more modest. I never gave them courage, he said. I was able to focus theirs. That's what great communicators do. They bring out the best in people and help them focus it so that they can accomplish great things. I've learned a different lesson from every great communicator that I've observed. But here's the one lesson I've learned from all of them. Great communicators always connect. Each communicator does it differently because there are so many different ways to do it. This is the most important lesson in communication. As you observe great communicators to learn from them, pay close attention to them and their audience while asking yourself these questions. When did the speaker connect? This is about timing. How did the speaker connect? This is about skill. How long did the speaker connect? This is about greatness. How can I connect like that speaker? This is about your potential. What are my connecting keys? This is about your technique. I'll teach you the keys to connecting in the Law of Connecting, Chapter 7. When you discover one of your connecting keys, you are on your way. And as soon as you do, practice it continually until it becomes a part of you. It must be natural to be effective. As you keep speaking, develop more connecting keys. The more you use to unlock your communication, the better you will connect. And that's one of the differences between good and great communicators. Good ones connect occasionally. Great ones connect continuously. If in the past you've been casual about learning communication by observing great communicators, I challenge you to become intentional about it. Go hear people speak in person. Watch TED Talks. Listen to podcasts. Study great speeches. You're living in a fortunate time when you have greater access to more great communicators than at any other time in human history. And do more than that. Travel. Walk in the footsteps of great communicators. Many times when visiting Washington, D.C., 
I have stood on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial where Martin Luther King Jr. gave his I Have a Dream speech and imagined the National Mall filled with people who were inspired to have hope. I've been on many other field trips to places where communicators touch lives. I have visited the bunker where Winston Churchill discussed England's darkest hours. I have read the speaking notes of Ronald Reagan in his presidential library. I have stood in the pulpit of the great transformational leader, John Wesley. I have talked with Pope Francis in St. Peter's Square after he delivered a message. I have sat with Billy Graham and talked about speaking to stadium crowds. I have interviewed Maya Angelou in a green room before we spoke. I have knelt and asked great communicators to pray over me. Why have I done these things, and why do I continue to do them? Because I want to make a difference, and I know speaking is one of the ways I can do that. The better I become a communication, the greater positive difference I can make. Good communicators are not born being able to speak. A Chinese proverb says, To know the road ahead, ask those coming back. If you want to become a good communicator, you need to learn from those who've gone ahead of you. Good communicators learn from great communicators. That's the law of observation. When I wrote Chapter 2, The Law of Observation, I became very introspective of my experiences. And one of the things that I want to convey to you from this great law is the fact that the reason I want you to uh, go to where great communicators have spoken and and uh, put yourself in places and positions to meet them and to uh, maybe ask them a question is because... Um, the power of communication is so important because who you know and what they have said to you and how they've interacted with you begins to be the way that you communicate with people. For example, I, I've been to London, England, and been to Charles Wesley's home many times, and I have literally sat at the little desk where he wrote. And I've just sat there maybe for five minutes, knowing that I'm a writer, knowing that my writing will never be as great as his, but but catching the spirit of John Wesley. When Norman Vincent Pill, uh, I met him in Veterans Memorial Auditorium, I can, I can tell you what he said in the speech to everybody in the auditorium was, was amazing. But what he said to me afterwards in just a brief moment was even more amazing. It's it's the touch of the great communicator. That's why when I go speak many times, I take si- time signing books because they're going to really remember that touch and the fact that I said hi to them and took a few seconds to sign the book more than even what I said. Here's what I'm trying to emphasize to you. In mentoring, of course, when we are mentored by somebody, we do it for learning purposes. We want to We want to have knowledge that they have. But what I say often is, who mentors you is as important as what they say. Now, what do I mean by that? Who mentors you, the person that you touch that touches you, there is a spirit that is transferred that cannot be received from a distance. And um, it's catching. It's There's a contagiousness about the fact that who they were begins to rub off to a little bit of who you are. If you're a person of faith, you heard me talk in the chapter about having great communicators pray over me. I've done that. I want their spirit. I want their anointing. Uh, If you're not a person of faith, you don't have to have them pray over you. It's okay. Just hang with them. Because that contagious, catchable spirit that is part of greatness in a communicator's life, who they are, will begin to transfer over to you. And I want that for you. In fact, honestly, that's why I'm just talking to you from my heart about chapter two in this wonderful law. I'm wanting you, as I read this book to you, I'm wanting you to catch my spirit, which is, I want to add value to you. And I want you to be better because we become friends on this tape. That's what I want for you. That's who I am. And that's what I think you'll receive.
Law number three, the law of conviction. The stronger you believe it, the more people feel it. What do you truly believe in? What value do you hold so dear that is deep in your heart and soul? What belief is so strong in you that you would be willing to live your life for it? So important that you would maybe even give your life for it. That is a conviction for you. As a communicator, you should seek to speak on subjects connected to what you deeply believe to your strongest convictions. Why? Because the stronger you believe it, the more people feel it. And that is the law of conviction. When I met Joanne Hessian, she was a highly successful business person. Born in Ireland, she had attended University College Dublin and earned a bachelor's degree in finance and a master's in management and organizational studies. She had founded and successfully led two businesses, one to help business schools around the world with leadership and accreditation projects, and another that trained people to become entrepreneurs. Joanne has not only a head for business, but also a heart for people, which had been developed in her 20s. She worked as a volunteer, helping victims in the Rwandan Civil War in refugee camps on the border of Tanzania, witnessing the poverty, loss, tragedy, and the corruption the refugees suffered. She had concluded that education is the only thing that couldn't be stolen from them. I met Joanne in 2016 in Orlando, Florida, when she decided to become a leadership coach and attended our Maxwell Leadership certified team training. I saw her again the following year when my nonprofit leadership foundation was launching an initiative in Paraguay offering values-based roundtables we call transformation tables. When we do this in a foreign country, many certified coaches volunteer to train local people as facilitators. When Joanne experienced the roundtable method of teaching values, she thought, this could work in Ireland. For many years, Joanne had desired to improve her country. After her experience in Africa, she recognized the benefits she and her fellow citizens possessed simply because of where they were born and their access to excellent education. She loved and believed in her country, but with those advantages, she believed the Irish could get better and do so much more. So in 2018, Joanne founded Lyft. L-I-F-T, Leading Ireland's Future Together. Her vision was to turn Ireland into what she called a first-world beacon of positive leadership. Stepping away from her work with the two companies, she dedicated herself full-time to the new nonprofit organization, which she led without pay for the first two and a half years. One of the first things she and her co-founders did was invest in research studies to learn what leadership qualities the people of Ireland believed were needed to improve their country. The top responses were listening, positive attitude, respect, empathy, honesty, and integrity, accountability, determination, and competence. With the help of the Global Priority Solutions, which pioneered teaching values through roundtables, LIFT, develop material to teach those qualities. Then to launch, Joanne sought input and support from business leaders and people across society, including education, sports, and community groups. Lyft paid for everything using what Joanne called the Robin Hood model, the organizations that can pay for it. For those who can't, we give it away. We never turn anyone away. It's for the people of Ireland, by the people of Ireland. I don't own it. Nobody else owns it. It's Ireland's. In four years, Lyft has trained more than 22,000 roundtable facilitators, engaged 355 organizations, partnered with 260 schools, one-third of the nation's total, and trained more than 50,000 people in leadership values. And Joanne and Lyft are still going strong. In 10 years, we want to train 10% of Ireland's population to improve the country, she said. After that, we'd like to share what we've learned with other countries. 
When Joanne founded Lyft, she originally intended to get it running and then return to her businesses. Not now. Her businesses are running well without her. Besides, why would she stop doing what she always was meant to do after she had finally found it? Her communication, her leadership, and her service are all connected to her conviction. She loves what she does, and it shows. Having convictions changes your life. Communicating with conviction changes other people's lives. I have a conviction that has charged me up and driven me to keep communicating into my 70s, and that conviction often causes me to be emotional. I believe that when people learn and live good values, they become more valuable to themselves and others. They gain value because they become more confident. They find a sense of direction and purpose. They do what's right, even when it's difficult, and they develop self-worth. It transforms their lives. They become valuable to others because they care about other people. The values they live help them improve their families by being better children, parents, and spouses. They become better neighbors. They contribute to society. They want to change their world, and they can. A group of transformed people can transform a community, a region, a nation, and beyond. That's why my nonprofit foundation has launched initiatives introducing transformation tables to countries such as Paraguay, where Joanne experienced them. For over a decade, I have shared my beliefs and values with millions of people and have watched many lives positively change. My bucket list has one gigantic desire. In my lifetime, I would like to see a country transformed because enough people in it have learned and live good values. Another conviction connects me to my certainty about the way values can transform people's lives and their world. Change needs to be led by transformational leaders. That's one of the reasons I dedicate so much of my time and energy teaching leadership. And when our foundation is invited to a country to teach values through transformation tables, I deliver a specific message to leaders in eight streams of influence in that country, government, business, education, media, arts, and entertainment, sports, family, and religion. It's called the characteristics of transformational leaders. I never grow tired of sharing it because it flows from my sense of conviction. I teach that transformational leaders see things others do not see, believe things others do not believe, say things others do not say, feel things that others do not feel, do things others do not do, and they receive things others do not receive. Every time I deliver this message, it is filled with conviction because I'm filled with conviction. If you want to be an energetic and effective communicator, you need to be a person of conviction. That begins with strong, positive beliefs about yourself, your audience, and the message that you have to offer others. Let's talk about those three convictions. First, personal conviction. I can make a difference. If you want to be a great communicator, your motivation for speaking must be to make a difference in the lives of people. To successfully make a difference, you must believe that you can make a difference. I believe I can make a difference. I believe I can change my world. You must believe that too. That's where your conviction must start. Speaker, author, and entrepreneur Ed Milet tells leaders, everybody you lead does not have to believe what you're saying. They only need to believe that you believe what you're saying. The same is true for communicators. If you're convinced that you can help people, they will listen to you and they will give you a chance. Number two is people conviction. I have the conviction that people can improve their lives. For you to make a difference in people's lives, you must hold the conviction that their lives can be improved. The two go hand in hand. In organizations, you often hear leaders say their people are their most appreciable asset. That is true, but only if you 
appreciate people by investing them with training, resources, and time. Too often leaders say they appreciate their people, but they don't show it. If they really believed it, they would do it. Good leaders and good speakers believe in people, believe they can change, believe they can grow, believe that they can improve, and they help them to do those things. Number three is purpose conviction. When I know my why, I know my way. One key to strong conviction in communication comes from knowing your purpose. Belief in yourself and your purpose creates a powerful combination. This is how these two convictions interact. Low personal belief plus low purpose belief equals basically, I won't get started. High personal belief but low purpose belief equals I won't continue. Low personal belief but high purpose belief means I won't achieve my purpose. Only when you have high personal belief and high purpose belief will you and I be able to achieve our purpose. You see, your purpose is connected to your strengths, something I discuss in the Law of Leverage, Chapter 8. But your purpose is also connected to your personal convictions. What are your strongest personal convictions? Can you articulate them? Have you connected them to your purpose? Do you use them in your communication? If you don't know the answers to these questions, I want to help you. For several years, my nonprofit organization has been teaching values to middle school and high school youth using the curriculum I developed and wrote with the assistance of Aaron Miller, a member of my writing team. As part of that teaching, we help students recognize what they feel, think, know, and do so they can develop convictions they can act on to change their world. The process is the same for adults. So I want to share these same ideas with you to help you identify your personal convictions. What do you feel? The feeling question can be the easiest to answer for most people because Feelings are accessible, and we react emotionally to so many things in our lives. If you pay attention to your emotions, you can learn from them. What we feel often influences our actions first. During a crisis, feelings usually dominate, but they also give us hints about what we are passionate about. What feelings speak to you? What touches your heart so deeply that it makes you cry? What gives you such joy that it makes your heart sing? What makes you so angry that you want to do something about it? What gives you hope to make a difference? Tap into your feelings to gain insight into your personal convictions. What do you know? While feelings are valid and give you clues about your convictions, they sometimes are not based on facts. That's why it's important for you to add what you know to how you feel. Following your feelings while ignoring facts will limit you, but relying on facts and ignoring feelings will frustrate you. You need to integrate the two. What do you know to be true no matter what? No matter what you feel, no matter what circumstances you face, what are those truths about life that you know you can take to the bank? These are also indicators of conviction. Integrating what you know with what you feel, will strengthen your convictions. What do you think? Thinking has great value because it brings feeling and knowing together, evaluates both, and seeks good conclusions. It acts as a highlighter, bringing out the best of your emotions and knowledge, and as a filter, removing the worst parts of each. No matter your age, you've experienced a lot of life. What have you observed? What have you figured out? What have you learned by examining your failures and successes? What are the principles and practices you've discovered that have helped you and that have the potential to help others? These also help you to recognize your convictions. What do you do? Now that you've examined your feelings, looked at the facts, and added what you have learned, it's time to identify your convictions and put them into actions. When you test a belief, if it's solid, it becomes a conviction. The value 
of values. When I was growing up, my strongest conviction related to my faith. As I grew older, I began to consider additional ideas, values, and principles that I could rely on. I discovered that convictions acted like anchors in a storm, holding me steady during rough times. They were like friends who gave me assurance when I was uncertain. They were like the North Star, able to guide me when I felt lost. They were like a cool drink of water, able to refresh me when I was weary. When I was in my mid-thirties, I created a talk called Principles That Guide My Life, because I believed that sharing my convictions would help others figure out theirs. I share them with you now with that very same hope. These are my principles that guide my life. Number one, my attitude determines my altitude. Number two, there's not much difference between success and failure. Number three, personal growth precedes professional growth. Number four, helping others succeed helps me to succeed. Five, having integrity is the only way to live. Number six, getting along with people is my most important ability. Seven, Paying now and playing later is the key to achievement. Eight, giving is the highest level of living. Nine, life is not a dress rehearsal, so live today fully. And ten, success is having the love and respect of those closest to me. If you're familiar with my speaking or have read any of my books, I'm sure you've seen these convictions come up over and over again. Why? I believe them 100%. They are part of my values. They have helped me have a satisfying and productive life. And they are part of my message. I believe they will do the same for anyone else who chooses to embrace and live them. So how do we communicate with conviction? So I ask again, what do you truly believe in? Do you know your convictions? If not, spend some time thinking about the principles that guide your life. If you have already identified your convictions, are you ready to use them to clarify your message, improve your communication, and make a positive difference in your world? You have the potential to become a communicator of conviction if you embrace and practice the law of conviction. In addition, here are three practical steps you can take right away to help your conviction improve your speaking. To communicate with conviction You must believe in these three things. Number one, believe in yourself. Professors Martin E. P. Seligman and Peter Schumann at the University of Pennsylvania performed studies on the impact of attitude and confidence on people's success. They chose to study insurance salespeople because they knew people in that profession deal with an especially high rate of rejection. What the two of them found was that salespeople who were optimistic lasted longer in the profession than those who were pessimistic. People with optimistic confidence sold 37% more insurance than those of their pessimistic counterparts. The lesson we can learn from their study carries over to communication. If you don't believe in yourself, how in the world will your audience believe in you? To be effective as a speaker, you must have confidence But that confidence must never cross the line into arrogance, or you'll lose your audience. Forbes contributing writer Travis Bradbury wrote about the power of confidence when it comes to leaders, but his observation applies equally to communicators. We gravitate to confident leaders because confidence is contagious, and it helps us to believe that there are great things in store. The trick as a leader is to make certain your confidence doesn't slip into arrogance and cockiness. Confidence is about passion and belief and your ability to make things happen. But when your confidence loses touch with reality, you begin to think that you can do things that you can't and have done things that you haven't. Suddenly, it's all about you. This arrogance makes you lose credibility. Great confident leaders, or may I say communicators, are still humble. They don't allow their accomplishments and positions of authority 
to make them feel that they are better than anyone else. Conviction brings confidence, and confidence fuels conviction. As long as the focus is on helping others, not advancing yourself. Number two, believe in your message and your audience. It's vital that you believe in both your message and your audience for you to communicate with conviction. In the next section of the book, What is Said, I discuss creating content. And in The Law of Connecting, Chapter 7, I write about the importance of your audience. If you lose belief in them, you'll have a hard time communicating effectively. If either belief wavers, your communication suffers. For several years, I owned a company called Enjoy Stewardship Services. Our mission was to help nonprofit organizations raise money, and we were successful. Our clients raised more than $3 billion for their causes with our assistance. The process always started with a member of our team going out to these organizations and making a sales presentation on how we could help them. One day, one of our presenters sat with me and said, I make the same presentation to hundreds of organizations, and I'm bored. Can you help me regain my passion for my talk? I started by asking him if he believed we were the right company for the job. Oh, yes, he said. We do a better job than any other company in our industry. I asked if he believed the message that he was sharing was the right one, or if there was a better way of finding our potential clients' challenges and presenting how our company could help them. Oh, he said, I believe in our message. I think we present in the best way we can. If there were a better method, I'd use it. Based on his answers, it was clear that he believed in the message, and I could come to only one conclusion. He was bored because he was focused on himself instead of the people who were listening to his presentation for the first time. He had conviction, but it wasn't focused on the people that he could help. When you speak, your conviction becomes contagious when your focus is on others and the benefits that they will receive from your message. That's when belief blossoms and gains real power. Ordinary presenters become extraordinary communicators when they believe in both. I have given some of my speeches hundreds of times, yet every time I give them, I'm fired up. Why? Because it's new to me? Oh, no. But it's because it's new to my audience. Because my message has helped me, I possess a strong conviction that it will help others. Are you convinced that what you have to say can help your listeners and impact them in a positive way? If so, your speaking will gain conviction. Number three, believe in the power of your words. When you carry conviction, you become certain, and certainty shows strength. That comes out in your language, which makes the communication of your message even stronger. What you say is positive, not negative. Your language is active rather than passive. Your phrasing is strong, not tentative. And when you believe in the power of your words, you also speak with emotion. That's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength. Don't be afraid to show your heart when you speak. Great communicators understand this. Winston Churchill wrote, The orator is the embodiment of the passions of the multitude. Before he can inspire them with any emotion, he must be swayed by it himself. Before he can move their tears, his own must flow. To convince them, he must himself believe. Churchill was only 23 when he penned those words, but he practiced them his entire life. As a communicator, when you are convinced you can help others and offer them the best course of action, people in your audience feel secure, gain confidence, and begin to accept your advice. If you are authentic, stand for something, live good values, and give your best, you will always strengthen your audience and add value to them. In 2020, when COVID-19 grew into a global pandemic, millions of people around the world died, and hundreds of millions more were traumatized. What struck me as everything shut down and people became isolated was that at a time when people needed help and reassurance most, they had difficulty receiving it. As a speaker who lives to add value to people, 
I found that particularly frustrating. In one week's time, my speaking calendar had gone from 235 dates to none, from the expectation of positively impacting a half a million people to zero. Everything in me knew that people wanted and needed help, and I would not be able to travel to them and give it. So what did I do? I decided to begin recording lessons every week that individuals and organizations could watch online to be encouraged and equipped. I chose to project strength and confidence that I hoped would help people get through the pandemic. I wanted people to receive not only help, but also hope, especially since none of us knew how long the pandemic would last. It was my way of trying to do my part during that difficult time. A different world cannot be built by indifferent people. If you want to make a difference, you need to know your convictions and act on them. And if you want to be a change-making communicator, you need to harness the power of your deepest beliefs when you speak. Why? Because the stronger you believe it, the more people feel it. That's the law of conviction. When I was a young communicator in my uh, middle 20s, I made a very important decision that I think put me on a path of, of the law of conviction that enabled me to speak at a higher level. And I want to share that decision with you because, honestly, it was a game changer for me. In my middle 20s, I was speaking a lot, and there were times I would speak on a subject that I really maybe wasn't totally convinced would change my life or change anyone else's life. But it was a good subject. It, it wasn't a bad subject, but it was something that would, it was nice, but I wasn't sure how effective it was. And then I made a decision. I made a decision not to speak on any subject that I had not personally experienced and found to help me to live a better life. In other words, I decided that I know we teach what we know, but we reproduce who we are. I decided to let my communication be filled with conviction that I could look with great trust into the people's eyes that were listening to me and say, this helped me, this will help you. That decision put me on the path that brought me to the law of conviction that I have just read to you. And I want to share with you that I want to encourage you to do the same exercise. Take an hour or two, look at what you speak about, and ask yourself, do I speak on these subjects or do I live these subjects? Do I speak about the knowledge of what I've heard they will do for others, or do I speak with the personal experience that they've changed my life? Here's what I know. As I said when I read the book, an indifferent world can only be changed with people who want to make a difference. If I really think it's a good subject, but it's not a great subject, why would I speak on it? If I think that it could help people instead of I know it will help people, why would I speak on it? So take some time and reduce your convictions to maybe a small number. I read to you mine, those that I had personally when I was in my 30s, and what's interesting now in my mid-70s, they still are true. Every one of those convictions, I can say, has proven to be true in my life. So I say, uh, speak on less, but what you speak on, if it's you, and if you know for sure it's changed your life, it has great power to positively affect others. So when I wrote The Law of Conviction, I hoped that you would not only get the understanding of this law, but you would feel in your heart the power of this law when you speak out of what you believe. When you believe in yourself, when you believe in your audience, and when you believe in your subject, conviction fills your talk. That's what you want. The next laws that I'm going to share with you come from the section in my book, 
on what is said. The fourth law is the law of preparation. You cannot deliver what you have not developed. Winston Churchill once commented on a rival by saying, he can be described as one of those orators who, before he gets up, does not know what he's going to say. When he is speaking, does not know what he is saying, and when he has sat down, doesn't know what he said. In other words, that person was prone to winging it instead of working it. Whether through arrogance or indifference, that may be too many speakers in what they do. But the reality is that without proper preparation, communication doesn't soar. It falls flat. Another entrepreneur and motivational speaker, Jim Rohn, said, You cannot speak that which you do not know. You cannot share that which you do not feel. You cannot translate that which you do not have. And you cannot give that which you do not possess. To give it and to share it, and for it to be effective, you first need to have it. Good communication starts with good preparation, and the best communicators always prepare. As I've said, my speaking career began as a pastor in Hillham, Indiana, a tiny farming community. The people there were delightful and enjoyed hearing me speak. I immediately gravitated to speaking. It was my favorite part of being a pastor, and I soon recognized I possessed a gift for communication. I also realized that because I was young, my congregation did not place high expectation on my speaking. No matter how good or poor the message, they seemed always pleased. One week, I ran short of time and prepared my message in only two hours. I was nervous about it and how it would be received, but the congregation didn't seem to notice the difference at all. That's when a thought occurred to me. I could wing it. I could do an adequate job using only a couple of hours of prep time and use the extra time to play golf at a great course less than three miles from my home. Would I wing it or work for it? If I were going to work for it, I would need 20 hours of prep time, 10 times more than I could get away with. It wasn't an easy decision. I was strongly tempted to wing it. But I finally chose to do the work. And I did that for three reasons. First, I was a rookie at preaching, and I recognized that I needed to spend a lot of time working on messages so that I could develop my preparation skills. Second, I knew I needed to study and grow in my knowledge and understanding of my subject material to become more mature and experienced in applying it to my own life before trying to pass it on to others. Finally, I believed that the people in my church deserved to receive the best that I could give them on Sundays, not something I slapped together. I made that decision 54 years ago, and I've never regretted it. In fact, as I look back at my journey as a communicator, I recognize it was one of the most important choices that I made. With the benefit of age, I know if you wing it, success is improbable. If you work for it, success is inevitable. People often ask me which I prefer, the preparation for teaching or the teaching itself. My answer is, <laughs> I love both. When I'm preparing a lesson, that's what I love the most. I find that thinking and the writing process is deeply satisfying. However, when I'm speaking, I love that the most. When I'm communicating with people, I think, I am made for this. Doing both things brings me deep satisfaction, and the bottom line is that great preparation helps me to communicate well as much as it helps the audience enjoy the message. One reason preparation is so valuable and enjoyable to me is that I need to communicate to myself before I communicate to my audience. Any message I want to deliver must speak to me before it can speak to others. If it hasn't helped me, it cannot help others. If I haven't learned from it, neither will my audience. If it won't prompt me to take action, how can I expect it to inspire others to take action when I deliver it? My first audience is me. Your first audience needs to be you. 
If what you prepare speaks to you, teaches you, inspires you to action, then it's probably ready for the second audience. Don't try to give what you do not have. Two messages in one. As a communicator, when I prepare for an audience, I am always working on two messages at the same time. The first message is specific to them and the situation. I think of it as my best message because I want to deliver the best content that I can. It's what every audience deserves. This is the message I prepare on paper to be delivered to my audience. It's the message they want and come to hear. It is specifically created to meet their present need and is intended to improve their lives. The other message is something I try to deliver every time, everywhere, to everyone. I think of this as my big message, and it's always the same. Where my best message is prepared on paper, my big message is prepared in my heart. It is what the people need to hear. It's bigger than the content because it's meant to develop people, and it answers four questions that I've learned to ask myself as a communicator because they frame my thinking and influence my speaking. One, what do I want the people to see? Two, what do I want the people to know? Three, what do I want the people to feel? And Four, what do I want the people to do? These questions may seem simple, but it took me years to wrestle them down. I worked and reworked them, changed and tweaked them, until my soul was satisfied. For 30 years, I made sure every message I deliver answers these questions. So let's start with question one. What do I want them to see? I want them to see their possibilities. How we view things determines how we do things. When people see their possibilities, their world expands. And I want to help people shift from asking, can I, to how can I. Can I is filled with doubt. How can I is positive and determined. It is filled with possibilities and encourages problem solving and action. Stephen R. Covey wrote about the difference between those two types of thinking in the seven habits of highly effective people. He said, Most people are deeply scripted in what I call the scarcity mentality. They see life as having only so much as though there were only one pie out there. And if someone were to get a big piece of pie, it would mean less for everyone else. The abundance mentality, on the other hand, flows out of a deep inner sense of personal worth or security. It is the paradigm that there is plenty out there and enough to spare for everybody. It results in the sharing of prestige and recognition of profits of decision-making. It opens possibility, options, alternatives, and creativity. I possess an abundance mentality, and every message I deliver comes from that outlook. I firmly believe everyone has greater possibilities, and I want to help them see those possibilities. When we were writing values curriculum for students in middle schools that the Maxwell Leadership Foundation would be using in South and Central America, we felt it important to teach an abundance mindset to the children. Aaron Miller, who helped write the curriculum, said, too many kids grow up in a negative scarcity environment where they have never seen their possibilities. Let's teach and show them who they could become if they develop their potential. That is a worthy goal of any teacher or communicator. When you prepare to communicate, do you see people's possibilities? More importantly, do you help them see their possibilities? Number two, what do I want them to know? I want them to know their value. Many people have been beaten down and discouraged by others. As a result, they don't recognize their own value. They feel like Charlie Brown, who was continually beaten down by Lucy in one comic strip, she railed. You, Charlie Brown, are a foul ball in the line drive of life. You're in the shadow of your own goalpost. You're a miscue. You are three putts on the 18th green. You are a 7-10 split in the 10th frame. 
a love set. You have dropped a rod and reel in the lake of life. You are a missed free throw, a shank, nine iron, and a called third strike. Do you understand? Have I made myself clear? <laughs> oh, my. Lucy's attitude is like way too many speakers. She talked down to others. Good communicators talk people up. They believe in their audience. They see their best. They encourage them because they see their value. Because I never want people to miss this, I tell them all the time I value them. Skeptical people have asked me, how can you say that you value me when you don't even know me? My response comes out of my faith. I value because God values you. He doesn't make mistakes. Valuing others begins with seeing value in yourself. Author and speaker Brian Tracy says, the more you like and respect yourself, the more you like and respect other people. The more you consider yourself to be valuable and a worthwhile person, the more you consider others to be valuable and worthwhile as well. How do you feel about yourself? Do you believe you have value? Do you believe you have something to offer others? Are you willing to believe others have value, and are you willing to express it? If you can answer yes to these questions and focus on people's value as you prepare your message and as you speak, it will transform your communication. Question number three, what do I want them to feel? I want them to feel empowered. The purpose of communication isn't to impress your audience, it's to empower your audience. You don't want people coming away saying, wow, she's amazing, she has done great things. You want them to say, wow, this is amazing, I can do great things. How can you empower people? Whether you're talking with two people or speaking to a large audience, do these five things. Embrace people's potential. I see everyone as a 10 out of a 10, and I tell them that. You can too. Give people permission to succeed. I try to open the gate for them to walk into new territory. You can too. Invite collaboration. This means working together aggressively as opposed to cooperation, which is merely working together agreeably. People are more likely to reach their potential when working with others. I encourage collaboration. You can too. Encourage ownership. As much as I want people to succeed, only they can make themselves successful by taking action. I encourage them to do that. You can too. Ask them to hold themselves accountable. People realize their possibilities when they are accountable for the results. I help them understand that achieving results fuels a cycle of encouragement. You can too. Empowerment is an incredible gift to give another person. It not only helps people believe that they have the freedom to be successful, it also helps them know others want them to be successful and believe that they can be. Number four, what do I want them to do? What I want them to do is apply and multiply. The speaker's challenge is to take an audience from know-how to do now. You want to help them apply what they learn and share it with others. I learned this because it was my privilege to be invited at a young age to speak with experienced communicators at success seminars. I enjoyed listening to them, was inspired by them, and along with the thousands in the audience, I gave them a standing ovation. I learned so much from watching them. I admired their great delivery, unbelievable stories, unforgettable quotes and hilarious humor. However, after a couple of years on that circuit, I slowly realized that most of the speeches ended with a standing ovation and nothing more. People walked away feeling good, but the next day, they did nothing about what they had heard. Observing this, I made a decision. I did not want to be a motivational speaker. Instead, I would become a motivational teacher. I wanted people to do more than feel good. I wanted them to go home feeling informed and inspired enough to take action to improve their lives. I still want them to do that now. Not only that, I want them to share what they've learned with others so that they can apply and multiply 
what I've given them. I never want them to be like the farmer who was asked by his neighbor, Are you going to attend the new county agent's class? Nope, answered the farmer. I already know a lot more about farming than I'm doing. (laughs) What good is being educated beyond your willingness to act? If I can describe possibilities to people that will expand their ability and capacity, give them a clear path toward those possibilities, and help them believe in themselves and inspire them to act, I can genuinely help them. And that's what communication is all about. The Value of Preparation In the early 20th century, Field and Yost coached the University of Michigan football team to a record of 165 wins and 29 losses and 10 ties during his 25-year tenure. He won the second most games in Michigan history. He often spoke about the importance of preparation versus the will to win. His words have been echoed by other influential coaches such as Vince Lombardi, Bobby Knight, John Wooden. Here's what Yost said. Preparation? That is the big thing. It is all right to talk about this will to win, but I tell you, it is not of much worth unless you have the will to prepare whether for the game you are about to play or for the business or profession you are to enter. A one-horsepower team cannot do much to achieve a great result. He must develop by preparation so that when the test comes, he has something to rely upon and is able to make use of it. The will to prepare is just as important in communication, and here's why. We play at the level of our preparation. Spectacular performance is always preceded by unspectacular preparation. I once asked John Wooden, the UCLA Bruins basketball coach, who won 10 national championships what he missed after his retirement from coaching. Practice, he answered without hesitation. Great practices make great teams. He went on to explain that he was very relaxed on the bench during games. Why? because the hard work had already been done in their preparation before the game. His players' level of practice determined their level of play. How you spend your time preparing is more important than how much time you spend preparing. As I prepare for any speaking engagement, I go through five steps to make sure I'll be ready at game time. Number one, ask setup questions. I always request a pre-call with the organization or host of an event that I will speak for. My goal is to add value to them and the people that I'll address. So at a minimum, I ask these questions. What is the event? Does it have a theme? Why have you chosen me to speak? What is the content? What is the context? What is the subject? Are there specific things you want me to talk about? What would you consider a win? Is there anything else that I can do to add value to you? You can create a great speech and deliver it with skill, but if it's the wrong message for the wrong people, it won't be successful, nor will it help anyone. Secondly, I prepare my subject. Once I know those details about my audience and context, I'm ready to work on my message. I always outline my message, unless I'm asked to speak extemporaneously in the moment. I write an introduction, but when I speak, I often springboard off the context of what is happening before I take the stage instead. Why? Because connecting is even more important than introducing my subject. I explain that in detail in The Law of Connecting, Chapter 7. For the body of my message, I write out my bullet points, starting with foundational ideas or the most important ones. I work to make the wording of these points memorable. If I can create a rhythm, pattern, or hook to make them build and sing, I will. I then add quotes, stories, and illustrations to the points to give them life, making them meaningful and fun. I finish the outline with an encouraging call to action. All the time I'm preparing my outline, I'm asking myself these three questions. How can I make it special? I give this a lot of thought ahead of time. I tailor my messages and focus on adding value so that it helps make it special. If I write a message from scratch, I often let people know by saying, 
I developed this lesson just for you, or I've never spoken on this before. How can I make it personal? The best way I know to do this is to pair what they do know with what they don't know. What they do know is based on their organizational, culture, personal experience, and national origin. What they don't know is the insight I'm trying to communicate to them. That puts my message into their context. How can I make it practical? I never forget that my goal is to help my audience. I write that into my outline, and if possible, I do a Q&A with my audience to help them apply the lesson. When I'm satisfied that I've been able to do these things, my outline is ready. Number three, I prepare myself. Before I speak, I want to prepare myself mentally, emotionally, and experientially. Again, I use questions to make sure I'm ready. I ask, do I know my teaching? I need to spend enough time with my outline that I know what I'm doing and where I'm going. I typically do this several hours before I speak. Do I feel my teaching? Good communication comes from the heart, and it goes to the heart of others. Do I live my teaching? When I was in my 20s, I decided I would never deliver a message that wasn't true to me. I would not deliver theories I hadn't tested and lived. When I can answer yes to those questions with integrity, I'm ready to communicate. Four, evaluate my effectiveness while speaking. When I step up to speak, it's game on, but it's also practice. Now, why do I say that? Because my greatest growth as a communicator has come during my speaking. Repetition is important. How do you get to be a better speaker? By speaking and pay attention to what works and what doesn't. As a young communicator, I sometimes found it difficult to evaluate my communication while speaking. For that reason, I often ask team members, to evaluate my talk and give me feedback. However, as I have matured as a communicator, my self-awareness of how I'm presenting myself has gotten better. Even while I'm delivering my message, I ask myself, am I comfortable and confident? Is my audience leaning in? When am I connecting with my audience? When am I not connecting? Is my audience staying engaged? Do they seem glad that they are hearing me speak? I continually adjust to make sure I keep connecting and my message keeps landing. If needed, I'll completely change the course if I sense that I'm not delivering in the way that I should. What I'm always trying to do is exceed my audience's expectations. That can be difficult because people's expectations keep rising every time I give a keynote speech. For that reason, I continually raise the bar for myself, and you should too. Consultant and former executive vice president and chief marketing officer at First Republic Bank, Diane Snedeker, advised, set your standards high and keep them high. If you are interested in success, it's easy to set your standards in terms of other people's accomplishments and then let other people measure you by those standards. But the standards you set for yourself are always the more important. They should be higher than the standards of anyone else that they would set for you. Because in the end, you have to live with yourself and judge yourself and feel good about yourself. And the best way to do this is to live up to your highest potential. So set your standards high and keep them high, even if you think no one else is looking. Somebody out there will always notice even if it's just you. If you hold yourself to a high standard when you speak, you will keep getting better. Number five, reflect to prepare for the next time. Even when I'm finished speaking, I'm not finished with my preparation. Every communication experience is an opportunity for learning through self-evaluation. I do that, you guessed it, (laughs) by asking myself questions. Did I accomplish the big message objective? Do they see their possibilities? Do they know their value? Do they feel empowered? Did I accomplish the best message objective? Did I help them? Are they likely to take action? Is there a way to make my message better? How can I upgrade my lesson notes? 
I've been communicating with people for more than 50 years, and it's very humbling to recognize how much more I need to learn. That's why I always reflect on every presentation after I make it, and why I upgrade my notes after every presentation. I am constantly learning. I am a work in progress. Preparation furthers personal development. After more than five decades of writing messages, I've come to the realization that one of the main reasons I'm still growing and developing at age 75 is that I write out, think through, and apply every message to my life before I teach it. Doing that work every time means I keep learning, improving, creating, discovering, developing, and growing. It's one of the most important disciplines in my life. When I made the decision to work it instead of wing it as a speaker, I realized that preparation would become continual in my life. When I decided to write books, I knew that it would be the same kind decision. But the rewards have been great because it helps me keep improving. As author Malcolm Gladwell pointed out, practice is the thing you do once you're good. It's the thing you do that makes you good. Preparation multiplies talent. What is the difference between talent and skill? Preparation. Talent is a gift. It's something that you are born with. The greater the natural talent, the greater the potential a person has in that area. But talent does not become a high-level skill without preparation, and here's how this works. Low gifting and low preparation equal no skill. Low gifting and high preparation equal average skill. High gifting and low preparation equals limited skill. High gifting and high preparation equals great skill. Hang on. High gifting and continual high preparation equals unlimited skill. The more you have been gifted with natural talent, the better you will be when you first get started, and the more tempted you will be to Rely on that talent alone, but if you want to reach your potential, you will need to put in the work. Continual preparation brings continual improvement. How much natural talent do you have when it comes to communication? Is your gifting high, low, or somewhere in between? How do you know? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, All great speakers were bad speakers at first. And I tell my new coaches, nobody's good the first time. If you've spoken once or twice, that doesn't tell you anything. The only way to find out is to speak before an audience and keep doing it. Frequency is the key to knowing. Until you speak frequently, you cannot make an accurate assessment. I've been told that mathematicians discount any statistics that lack necessary frequency. For example, if you flip a coin 10 times, you will rarely experience a 50-50 split between heads and tails. However, if you flip a coin a hundred times, it's usually pretty close. The same is true with speaking. You can't do it once, twice, or a dozen times and know whether you have talent. You can't measure your potential at that stage. You need to get in your reps. I used to say, all's well that begins well. Now, when it comes to speaking, I tell people, all's well that begins. If you're afraid of public speaking, you need to begin speaking, and you need to continue doing it. You need to practice. The only way to achieve excellence in anything that you do is to do it enough times to test it. Wisdom will come as a result of doing something enough times that you can see the whole picture and develop understanding. I love the way James Clear expresses the importance of frequency in his book Atomic Habits. He says, It doesn't matter if it's been 21 days or 30 days or 300 days. What matters is the rate which you perform the behavior. You can do something twice in 30 days or 200 times. It's the frequency that makes the difference. I'm very fortunate. I started my career as a senior pastor, which meant on the average I spoke three times a week for 50 weeks a year. In the three years I spent in my first position, I put more than 400 reps under my belt. That kind of early practice was really controlled failure. I'd try new things, take risks, and experiment. The story of those early days was fail early, fail often, (laughs) fail forward. 
The preparation got me ready for later speaking opportunities. Today, I estimate that I've spoken more than 13,000 times, and I can tell you what the secret sauce is for speaking. Frequency and consistency. Frequency gives you short-term progress. If you speak frequently, you can start to get it. Consistency gives you long-term progress. If you speak consistently, you will be able to keep it. And the preparation and practice will never stop if you want to be at the top of your game. Just ask any elite athlete, concert pianist, highly sought-after speaker, or high-level performer in any profession. The higher you climb in proficiency and public acceptance, the greater the need to practice. Excellence is a result of many practices. So if you're gifted in speaking and you wing it, you may be in the top 50% of the communicators. But if you're gifted and you work it frequently and consistently, you can be in the top 5%. Pay the price of preparation. One of the things that gives me joy is playing golf. I love everything about it, except my scores. I'm not as good as I would like to be. So I recently went to see my golf instructor, Warren Bakke, and I told him I wanted to improve my handicap. I want to take my handicap from a 15 down to a single digit, I said. You can do that, he replied, which greatly encouraged me. Excited I was ready for him to tell me what to do. He said, To reach that goal, you'll need to practice 30 hours a week. Wow, I responded. That's a lot of practice. This reminded me of a time when I was hosting a leadership conference with over a 1,000 people in attendance. It was a wonderful day filled with laughter, learning, interaction, and growth. And during the afternoon break, a young man came up to me and said, I'm inspired. I've decided I want to do what you do. I just smiled. Let me ask you a question, I responded. Would you like to do what I did so you can do what I do? (laughs) He had no idea what it took for me to be able to do what I did on stage. As my friend Brian Tracy said, your success in your career will be in direct proportion to what you do after you've done what you were expected to do. After thinking about this, I looked at my golf instructor and said, I've changed my mind. I decided to live with my handicap the way it was and play golf when I want to with little practice. I love golf, but it's not my calling. I wish for a single-digit handicap, but my wish and my will to prepare were worlds apart. People who wing it end up with lots of wishes that go unfulfilled. People who work it get results. As you work to become a better communicator, After you spend some time speaking, you'll need to gauge your level of gifting and your level of commitment. If you prepare and practice, you may become good. You may even be able to become great. But remember, you cannot deliver what you have not developed. That's the law of preparation. When I wrote the chapter on the law of preparation, it really brought me back to that early decision that I shared with you a moment ago. Am I going to wing it or am I going to work for it? Now, here's what I want you to hear from me because I think this is a game changer for all of us. If you're highly gifted, the temptation to wing it is very great. Why? Because with your giftedness, you can get by and in the eyes of most people, be very successful. So for a gifted person, they kind of say, why do I need to prepare to the level of a person that's not gifted? Why do I need to practice as long as a person that doesn't have those gifts and abilities? That's the way we think. That's the way that I thought. And in my early days, I was tempted because I knew that with two hours of preparation, I could speak, that I thought I can get by with winging it. And the problem is, I could get by with winging it. But what I was missing was the big picture. If I continually work at it, that work is stored before it shows up. One day, I become, in the eyes of people, a a great communicator, and it's almost like it was an overnight kind of a miracle that happened in my life, but it's not true at all. 
What I was doing in my preparation is I was storing up knowledge, experience, intuition. And one day, after storing it up for a long period of time, that consistency of storing began to show up. And when it showed up, it wasn't that I got brilliant the night before. It was the fact that I had done my homework for weeks, months, and years. Now, I say that because I have a great desire for you to be uh, a great communicator. And if you're going to be a great communicator, here's how it works. You can only be great if you're gifted and you practice a lot. You got to be gifted and you got to work at it. The moment that you make that decision, the sky's the limit. I, I don't know. I don't know how far you can go, but I know this. You're going to go far. And why do you go far? Because the better you are, the better the people become. It's just a fact. The leader, the communicator, determines the path and the speed of progress. It's true in your life and it's true in my life. So when you think of preparing, don't think of it as this is the homework I've got to do to make a great speech. Think of it as this is the homework I do to make me a great person. Because if I'm a great person, I have the possibility of reproducing in others greatness. That's what you want. That's why you work for it, not wing it. That's the law of preparation. Law number five, the law of collaboration. Some of your best thinking will be done with others. Aspiring communicators often ask me, what advice do you have for me if you want to start speaking? My first piece of advice is, <laughs> start speaking. The best way to learn and improve as a communicator is to practice, which I just discussed in the law of preparation. What's the second piece of advice? Enlist the help of other people. I didn't understand this when I started my speaking career. I began as the Lone Ranger. My professional speaking and leadership careers started at the same time when I was 22. Back then, I believed that if I asked for help, the people who listened to me and followed me would view me as weak, and they would stop following and stop listening. As a result, I tried to do every leadership and speaking task myself. If I had a problem, I worked alone to figure it out on my own. When I got an idea, I'd think, I'll work on this until it's really good. And then I'll share it with the people and everyone will think I'm brilliant. What a mistake. It would take me a decade to understand what would become what I call the law of significance, which says one is too small of a number to achieve greatness. The same applies to communication. One is too small of a number to achieve greatness. Relying 100% on myself early in my career created two glaring problems for me. First, I often taught based on assumption. I assumed that I knew what the people needed, but of course, I didn't. That meant I often spoke on subjects no one wanted to hear about, giving solutions that they were not looking for. Thank goodness my audience was grace-giving and took my youth and inexperience into consideration. The second problem was that everything I communicated was from my own limited personal experience and perspective. Again, that meant I missed so much and often failed to connect with people. As journalist and author William H. White observed, the great enemy of communication is the illusion of it. I assumed I was communicating and connecting, but often I was talking only to myself. Back then, I didn't know the law of collaboration which says some of your best thinking will be done with others. So what is the value of collaboration? Billionaire philanthropist Andrew Carnegie said, It marks a big step in your development when you come to realize that other people can help you do a better job than you could do alone. That was a step I took in my speaking, and it's one I hope that you will too. Several years ago, James Sir Ricky wrote a book called The Wisdom of Crowds. In it, he describes how groups of people often solve problems and come to conclusions more accurately than individuals alone, 
even when some of those individuals are experts in the field. Surowiecki opens his book with a compelling example that occurred in Britain more than a hundred years ago. In 1906, scientist Francis Galton was attending a country fair called the West of England, Fat Stock and Poultry Exhibition, where local farmers and townspeople gathered to show their cattle, sheep, horses, chickens, and pigs. Galton, an expert on heredity and statistics, attended because he was interested in the efforts of breeding on physical and mental qualities in livestock, but he was also interested in human genetics. One of the events at the fair was a competition in which attendees could pay sixpence to guess how much a live ox on exhibit would weigh after it was butchered and dressed. A difficult task. The people with the best guesses would receive prizes. Seeing this, Galton got an idea. He wondered how good the people in the group would be at making such a guess. A few might have expertise in livestock or butchering, but most would not. Galton, an 85-year-old curmudgeon with a low opinion of people, expected people to guess poorly. He later wrote, Many non-experts competed like those clerks and others who have no expert knowledge of horses, but who bet on races guided by newspapers, friends, and their own fancies. Galton asked the organizers if he could borrow the entry slips for the contest after it was over. Each slip of paper contained the person's guess and their personal information. When he received them, Galton did a statistical analysis of the 780 slips of paper he examined. As you might guess, nobody guessed the exact weight of the dress ox, which was 1,198 pounds, not even the professional butchers. But Galton was shocked to discover that when he calculated the average of all of the guesses, it was 1,197 pounds, only one pound off from the actual weight. His conclusion, most of us, whether as voters or investors or consumers or managers, believe that valuable knowledge is concentrated in a very few hands. We assume that the key to solving problems or making good decisions is finding that one right person who will have the answer. The argument of this book is that chasing the expert is a mistake and a costly one at that. We should stop hunting and ask the crowd. To become a better communicator, that's what we need to do. Seek the wisdom of others, not from a random crowd, but from a team or a trusted group. As Sir Wiki points out, groups are often smarter than the smartest people in them. It took me a while to learn this lesson, but now, any time I'm preparing to speak or to lead, my first thought is, who do I need to collaborate with? I understand that success begins with we, not me. No one person has all the answers. Every speaker or leader has blind spots and shortcomings. No individual is completely well-rounded and balanced, but teams can be. When asked my team to help me, they always make me better. No wonder former NFL coach Bill Parcells used to remind his players, individuals play the game, but teams win championships. When I'm getting ready to write a book, I often bring together a group of people to help me. This book was no exception. I started with my writing team. Together we worked on the preliminary list of laws. I then sent the list to a group of excellent communicators so they could spend time looking at them, thinking about them, and considering ways to improve them. These communicators, my team and I met, and they took the ideas to a new level. The book you're reading is a result of that collaboration. One of the most popular books I've written is How Successful People Think. In the chapter on shared thinking, I explain why I value collaborative thinking so highly. Shared thinking is faster than solo thinking. Shared thinking brings more maturity than solo thinking. Shared thinking is more creative than solo thinking. Shared thinking is the only way to have great thinking. Great thoughts are birthed out of many good thoughts, and shared thinking returns greater value than solo thinking. When I share my thoughts with a group of good thinkers, they come up with ideas I never would have had. I may go into a meeting with a good idea, but I walk out with better ones. Collaboration has a multiplying effect. 
It's like the difference between one plus one, which is two, and one beside one, which is 11. Characteristics of a good collaboration team. In my many years of speaking and leading, I've learned that success or failure is not determined by the weight of what you need to accomplish or the heaviness of the load you carry. It's determined by the people you collaborate with to help you accomplish the task. With that in mind, I want to give you some guidelines to help you identify the kinds of people you will want to bring onto your team to help you become a better communicator. Number one, good collaborators have an open mindset. For people to help you improve in communication or in any endeavor for that matter, they need to be able to see possibilities. They need to see possibilities in you, in your potential, in your audience, in your ability to impact them, and in their ability to take what you say and run with it. Negative, narrow-minded people will not help you. Only open people will. When I look for good collaborators, I seek people who possess two qualities. First, they need to be people who think in terms of abundance, not scarcity. They must believe there are always solutions not doubt that something is possible. I discovered the importance of this difference in thinking in my early 30s when I was asked to be a part of a team writing commentaries on every book of the Bible. The invitation was an honor because all the other writers were older, more experienced, and more successful than I was. I was asked to write the commentary for Deuteronomy, and as soon as I got started, I knew I was in over my head. I began to doubt whether I could accomplish such a daunting task. Can I do this? I began asking myself. This question began to undermine my efforts and my doubts increased. I started making excuses for not working on it, and the longer I avoided the task, the larger it appeared, and the greater number of reasons I saw for it being impossible. Fortunately, the other writers who were working on their commentaries at the same time encouraged me. They imparted wisdom and gave me advice. They became my support team, and my mindset began to change. I began looking for solutions. Those solutions helped me to make progress. When you ask, can I, the answer might be no, but when you ask, how can I, the answer almost always leads to yes. It took me a year but I completed the task, and I'm very proud of the work that I did. The second quality I look for in potential collaborators is an options mindset. I want them to be like the old chicken farmer whose land flooded nearly every spring. He didn't want to sell the family farm and move, but he was getting tired of having to move hundreds of chickens every year and losing many of them. After an especially bad flood, he was complaining to his wife. Every year you whine about the same thing, she said, and I'm tired of hearing about it. Well, he barked, what do you think I should do? She looked at him and replied, buy ducks. <laughs> okay, that's a corny old story. But it shows the kind of mindset you want from people who will help you. An option mindset causes people to believe there are many solutions to any problem. And when there is more than one way, that means there's always a better way. Every time I speak, I give it my best shot. But that doesn't mean I can't get better or that I can't give it another better shot. No matter what I do, I believe I can find a way to improve. The challenge is to find it. Number two, good collaborators ask and answer questions. Woodrow Wilson said, We should not only use all the brains we have, but all the brains we can borrow. When collaborators ask questions that stir my thinking or answer my questions, it's like getting to borrow their brains. Their thinking improves my thinking. I love questions. I learn so much from asking them and listening to answers. Recently, I was teaching a lesson called Questions to Ask to Develop Your Leadership to a group of high-level leaders, and afterward during a Q&A, a leader asked, do you ask questions if you sense that you will not like the answer? He was articulating what all of us have felt at times, suspecting that we have a problem and not really wanting to face it. Yes, I answered. I asked the question even when I may not like the answer. Even though it can be painful, 
Some of the answers I don't like can be the ones that help me the most. As you work to become a better communicator, you should not avoid asking tough questions that you might not like the answers to. You must have courage and be honest with yourself if you want to improve. Here are some questions that may help you. Questions before you speak. If you share your notes with your team before you speak, they can ask these five potentially tough questions to help you prepare. One, have I seen the speaker live this message? Two, how has this subject influenced my life? Three, what do I not know about this subject that I need to know? Four, what is the most important part of this message and why? And five, what is the one thing I would do to improve this presentation? If your team members honestly share their responses to these questions with you, they can help you. The best time to improve your communication is on the front end before you do it. Obviously, your team could ask you many other questions as well, but these are designed to help you improve before you deliver the speech. Questions after you speak. Your team can help you improve after you speak if they answer these questions. Number one, what was the response of the audience on a scale of one being low and five being high? Two, what was the strongest five minutes of the message? Three, what was the weakest five minutes of the message? Four, how can the lesson be improved? Five, how can the speaker be improved? Your team's answers to these questions will help you expand the best part of your message, eliminate the weakest part, and improve your connection with the audience. One more thought about questions. What you ask and how you ask makes a difference. Albert Einstein is reputed to have said, If I had an hour to solve a problem and my life depended on the solution, I would spend the first 55 minutes determining the proper question to ask. For once I know the proper question, I could solve the problem in less than five minutes. This addresses the importance of thinking about asking the right question. The more well thought out the questions are, the better the answers will be. And when the questions are asked in the spirit of improvement, not criticism, the more helpful they will be. Number three, good collaborators generate ideas. In addition to being open-minded to asking and answering questions, good collaborators are also capable of coming up with good ideas. This may be the greatest value your team will bring because great speeches contain ideas that spark the imagination of the audience. It's important to remember that an idea doesn't have to be your idea to be good. What's important is that every idea be brought to the table so that the best idea can win. As you bring together a collaborative team to help you with ideas, here are some things that you should do. Ask everyone to generate as many ideas as possible. I've always found it to be true that the greater the quantity of ideas, the greater the quality of ideas. The more ideas you test, the more likely you are to find good ideas that work. Here's what I know from experience. The only bad ideas are the ones that die without birthing another idea. The team's best ideas added together should give you a breakthrough. Ideas are like rabbits. Get a couple and they multiply. A Romanian-born artist said, Creativity is to see what everybody has seen and to think what nobody has thought. You and your team can discover an idea and take it in a whole new direction. Today I have a reputation for being an excellent communicator, but like many people, I started out as an average speaker. But as I explain in the Law of Preparation, I got a lot of practice. During those early years, I tested a lot of ideas. Many of them didn't work. I lived the speaker's cycle of success. Communicate, fail, learn, develop, connect. The good news is that I learned a lot. The bad news is that if I'd had a team helping me generate ideas and improve them, I could have tested many of those ideas before I stepped in front of an audience, and my communication would have improved more quickly. 
adapt the ideas of others. Early in my career, I may not have had a team to help me come up with good ideas, but I did have access to books and tapes. I spent many hours reading and listening for good ideas. If I came across a quote or an idea that grabbed me, I saved it. This was the start of the law of collaboration for me. Some of my best ideas came from other people. Often I simply quoted them, but the more ideas I discovered and digested, the more ideas of my own I generated springboarding off the ideas of others. I have developed a lifestyle of looking and listening for great ideas, and it has led to some of my best work. Here are some examples. One evening, I was having dinner in Chicago with Robert Kiyosaki, the author of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. During our conversation, he said, Sometimes you win, sometimes you learn. That got my attention. I love that statement. And I asked him if I could use those words for the title of a book. He said yes, and that became the title of my book, Sometimes You Win, Sometimes You Learn. I was playing golf with Victor Oliver, my editor at the time, and he told me about a marketing book that he had read, and he later showed it to me, The 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing. John, he said, you should write a book on the laws of leadership. That idea was the impetus for me to write The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership, which is now the best-selling leadership book of all time. When I was writing Everyone Communicates, Few Connect, my writing team convinced me to release the book online one chapter at a time. As we posted the chapters on my blog, we asked readers to make comments to help improve the book. We received hundreds of responses. The best ideas went into the book, and we gave the people credit. I could hardly count all the ways my team and other thinkers have helped me to become a better speaker, writer, and leader. Ideas are birthed during times of collaboration. Ideas are proven during times of action, and ideas are improved during times of reflection. If you want more and better ideas, learn to collaborate with others. That's where the process starts. Soon you'll be using them to generate good ideas of your own. Capture every good idea. Most speakers write a message and then spend hours, days, or weeks searching for ideas, quotes, stories, and anecdotes to include. They think, I read that somewhere. Which book was that in? And they start rummaging through their bookshelves, or they start searching the Internet. When I sit down to write a message, I spend mere minutes gathering top-notch material. How is that possible? I've been looking for material for almost 60 years, and I've captured the best and filed it where I can put my hands on it literally in seconds. As I already mentioned, I knew from the age of 18 that I wanted to be a public speaker. That's when I started looking for ideas. My father is the one who encouraged me to capture them so I could use them. He would say to me, the number one time waster is looking for things that are lost. You won't lose things if you have a place to put them. That's what prompted me to develop my filing system. When I'm reading a book, if I find a quote I like, I stop right then and mark it on the page in brackets. And I ask myself, what subject should that be filed under? When I know the answer, I write the word next to the passage. Then I flip to the inside cover of the book, and I write the page number where I saw the quote and the subject. As I continue to read, if I find other quotes, I do the same. When I'm done with the book, I give it to my assistant and she photocopies each quote and it goes into my file on that subject. If I'm reading a magazine or a newspaper and I see a quote or a story I like, I mark it, decide on the subject, and rip out the page to keep. It goes into that subject file. If I'm listening to a podcast or a tape and hear something I want to capture, I get the whole message transcribed and mark the passages I want to keep. And you guessed it. Those go into the files by subject. This is how I have so many ideas, quotes, and anecdotes on hand and ready to use. When I'm writing a lesson and need a quote or idea, I turn my chair so that I can reach my files, grab the subject file I'm looking for, and find something that works. Every day I am preparing material to write and speak because I never stop looking for it, and I never waste time finding it. And here's what's great. 
My team also collects ideas, quotes, and anecdotes for me. When my writing partner, Charlie Wetzel, first began working with me almost 30 years ago, he wasn't good at finding the kind of material that I wanted. He came from an academic background, so he looked for ideas that were smart or clever. I had to teach him my criteria. Anything I use must check one of these boxes. Heart. It must touch people at an emotional level. Help. I give people something that they can think or do that improves their life. Humor. It makes them laugh. Hope. It inspires them and helps them believe in a better future for themselves and others. I call those the four H's. Heart, help, humor, and hope. All of these are ways to add value to people. Charlie still writes with me and collects ideas, but the workhorse for this in recent years has been Erin Miller. She is constantly searching for material for me that helps me in my verbal communication in my books. And coming up behind her is a newer member of our team, Jared Cagle. He's learning the ropes, and he's contributing, too. You may already have a team of people helping you generate good ideas. If not, I encourage you to create one. But even before that, you can start capturing ideas yourself. Every day, you can read and listen to find and file material for the future. If you develop that discipline, great material will be there when you need it. Number four, good collaborators give honest feedback. The final quality I look for in good collaborators is the willingness and the ability to give good feedback. That's important because good communicators never stop trying to get better. I've been speaking for nearly five decades. I speak around 250 times a year, and I'm still working to get better. After I speak, the first person I ask for feedback is my host. Exceeding my host expectations is my first objective. But even when I succeed, that's not enough for me. I want to improve. So I ask for feedback from trusted members of my team. Here's why I'm such a fanatic for feedback. I don't see myself as others see me. Feedback increases my self-awareness and helps remove my blind spots. I don't see things as others see them. Feedback gives me a broader perspective than if I just rely on my own limited experience. I don't see everything, so I ask, what am I missing? I always assume that I am missing something, but if I don't intentionally ask people to point it out, they may not. It shows my team I value their opinion. I want to demonstrate to my team that I value them and care what they think. Everyone feels complimented when you ask their opinion. It's a catalyst for improving. I won't get answers to questions I don't ask. If I ask, I learn, and I can adjust. It's the best way to discover the best idea. Again, the best way to get a great idea is to put together many good ideas. Anyone can give you valuable feedback. The more different people are from you, the more value their feedback is likely to have because they will see things that you don't. However, I found that the most valuable feedback comes from other successful communicators. While non-communicators may be able to tell you when you fail to connect with your audience, experienced communicators can tell you what caused their breakdown and why. So especially seek feedback from them. One of the great communicators I've admired for many years is Chuck Swindoll. When I moved to California in my 30s, he was already a successful author and speaker, and he kindly took me under his wing. I was so grateful. He's someone who understands the value of collaboration. Years ago, he wrote a piece called No Place for Islands. I love it because it illustrates the importance of working with other people. In part, it says, nobody is a whole chain. Everyone is a link, but take away one link and the chain is broken. Nobody is the whole team. Everyone is a player, but take away one player and the game is forfeited. Nobody is a whole orchestra. Each one is a musician, but take away one musician and the symphony is incomplete. Nobody is a whole play. Each one is an actor, but take away one actor and the performance suffers. 
Nobody is a whole hospital. Each one is a part of the staff. But take away one person and it isn't long before the patient can tell. You guessed it. We need each other. You need someone and someone needs you. Isolated islands? We're not. To make this thing called life work, you gotta lean and support and relate and respond and give and take and confess and forgive and reach out and embrace and release and rely. Since none of us is a whole, independent, self-sufficient, super-capable, all-powerful hotshot, let's quit acting like we are. Life's lonely enough without our playing that silly role. The game's over. Let's link up. If you want to become the best communicator you can, don't try to do it alone. Seek out others to help you. Develop a team. Ask for help. Work together. You'll never regret it. Why? Because some of your best thinking will be done with others. And that's the law of collaboration. Every time I think of the law of collaboration, I think of a statement that I heard many years ago, and that is, some of my best thinking has been done by others. This was a mistake that I made in my uh, younger communication years. As I shared when I read you this chapter, I, I just tried to carry way too much on my own. And it was a lot out of insecurity. You know, what happens if I ask a lot of questions? People will think I don't have answers. What I discovered is this, and, and I discovered it over time. Now it seems simple, and I give it to you because it's kind of compact, and it won't take you the years it took me to get to where you really want to be. What I discovered was simple, that no matter how long I thought about a speech I was going to give or a subject that I wanted to develop or an idea that I thought maybe I could improve on, no matter how much time I gave it, I, if I gave it a day, uh, a week, a month, it, it didn't matter. No matter how much time I gave it just by myself, when I would release that thought, idea, subject, question, to a group of people, almost instantly, they would improve it. And I would ask myself, how could that happen so seemingly effortlessly? And how could that happen so quickly? And, and then I realized they saw my subject from their perspective. And the moment that they used their perspective on my subject, they could generate new thoughts, new ideas that I would have never had because I was just coming from my own personal perspective and no other. Well, it was humbling, first of all, but it was also incredibly um, liberating to me when I realized that whatever I'm doing, when I have come to the very best effort I personally can give it, if I'll give it to good people, they'll just make it better. Several years ago, I wrote a book called The 17 Laws of Teamwork, and one of the laws of teamwork is the law of Mount Everest that just simply says, as the challenge escalates, and of course, Mount Everest is a big challenge. It's a mountain. As the challenge escalates, the need for teamwork elevates. In other words, the need for teamwork elevates. In other words, if you're going to climb a little hill, you can do that by yourself. You don't need collaboration at all. Just put on your tennis shoes and go climb the hill. But if you're going to climb Mount Everest, you're not doing it alone. And I think that most of us would like to have a a Mount Everest experience. And I think most of us would like to have a, a Mount Everest reward. And if we're going to do that, we need to team up, or as my friend Chuck Swindoll would say, we need to link up and do it together. Remember, one is too small of a number to achieve greatness. That's the law of collaboration. Law number six, the law of content. When you have something worth saying, people start listening. In January 1996, Microsoft co-founder Bill Gates wrote an essay about the future of the Internet. The title of his piece was, Content is Keen. He believed the fledgling online world of the 1990s and 2000s 
would take a path similar to the one broadcast media had up to that point, where the people who created content would be the influencers, not the technologist. Now, more than 25 years later, his assertion has proven true, and his statement about content has been repeated thousands of times by content creators, business executives, marketers, and media moguls. If content is keen, then communication is queen. They rule together, and they cannot be separated. What value does content have if it's not communicated to anyone? And what value does communication have if there is no content? One of the greatest challenges speakers face is the fact that the average person hears thousands of messages every day. Communicators are vying for people's attention in this environment. In a world where we can instantly access the content on virtually any subject, how can you make your content and message stand out? How can you grab people's attention and hold it long enough to make a positive impact on them? How? Well, you work at it. And here's the good news. When you have something worth saying, people will start listening. That's the law of content. Every message is like a puzzle. The goal for you as a communicator is to display a picture, making it easy for your audience to see it and understand it. As you generate the content of your talk and plan it, you are like a puzzle maker. You are laying out your ideas, which are the puzzle pieces of your message. You must work to make sure all the pieces fit together to create a compelling picture. But the challenge is that the people listening to you, when you deliver the message, will be the ones that will assemble the puzzle from scratch and create a meaningful picture in these 5, 15, or 60 minutes that you have for speaking. If they can't put it together and enjoy the process, you haven't succeeded as a communicator. I first began to think about this process as puzzle-making after reading business and leadership consultant Peter Meyer's description of jigsaw management. He compares leading people to putting together a puzzle and says the task of the owner or general manager is to make the box top clear. He goes on to talk about the pressure people feel when they must put together a puzzle in a compressed amount of time and their frustration when pieces are missing or their annoyance if the extra pieces that don't belong have been added. Most communicators have more to say than they have time to say it. That means you must be selective. You can't give people a thousand-piece puzzle in a 100-piece time slot. If you try to include more than a few main ideas in your message, you have too many. Think about the picture that you want to create. What is on your box top? Your goal must be to include all the pieces needed to complete the picture with no extra pieces that might detract from it or confuse your audience. As you know, not everyone who speaks is as selective as they should be. For example, Felix Frankfurter, a noted professor at Harvard Law School, served as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States from 1939 to 1962. Even though his career required him to speak frequently, he wasn't known for making his messages easy for people to follow. His wife, Marion, who was a writer and an editor, often pointed out his limitations as a speaker. <laughs> there are only two things wrong with Felix's speeches. He digresses, she explains, and then he returns to the subject. Let's put the content puzzle together. If you don't want people in your audience to become frustrated when you stray from your subject and when you return to it, you need to become skilled at designing the puzzle of your message. You want people to be able to follow your thinking and see the picture that you're trying to create. Here are the nine steps that you can follow as you create your content. Step one, start with your audience. Great content begins with understanding your audience. In the Law of Preparation, Chapter 4, I explain the pre-call I make to the organization for which I will be speaking so that I can ask questions about the organization, audience, and event. It's vital to look beyond their marketing lingo and publicity 
to know who they are, understand what motivates them, and determine what they need. When you don't know your audience or don't craft your content to fit them, you're in danger of losing them, like the father of a four-year-old boy who was eating an apple in the back of the car. After taking a bite and holding the apple a few minutes, he said, Daddy, yes, why is my apple turning brown? Well, his father explained, after you ate the outer skin off, the meat of the apple came into contact with the air, which caused it to oxidize, changing its molecular structure and thus turning it into a different color. There was a long silence, and the little boy asked softly, Daddy, are you talking to me? I like what communication expert and author Nancy Duarte said about a speaker's audience. The audience is the hero who will determine the outcome of your idea, so it's important to know them fully. Jump into the shoes of your audience and look carefully at their lives. While it is vital for any communicator to put themselves in the shoes of their audience, it's even more important to do that if the audience considers the speaker to be more successful than they are, because in their minds there is a success gap. And great communicators close that gap. Recently, I was talking with my friend Chris Hodges, who hosts a large annual event for pastors called Grow Leader. He was preparing his message for the audience of 5,000, and he asked my advice about his opening message. Now, Chris is a down-to-earth person of great humility, but he is also the founder and the leader of one of the largest and most influential churches in the world. I knew that there would be a perceived success gap, so my advice was simple. I suggested that he open his talk with how he started as a pastor. Tell them that you did not know what to do, and the things you attempted didn't always work. Let them know that in the beginning you had more questions than answers, and you never thought that your church should be one of the most influential churches in the world. Now, why did I give him that advice? I wanted his audience to see him as they see themselves. There was no obvious path from where they were to his level of success. He had to put on their shoes, go back to his beginning, and let everyone know that he once stood where they were. When Chris did this, the pastors knew that he understood them. Feeling understood opened them up to his message. As you prepare a message, always start with finding out who your audience is, and considering your subject from their point of view. Number two, stay in your strength zones. When you know who your audience is, you begin to get a sense of what they need. What will you try to give them? The danger is trying to give them something they need that you don't have. That is the recipe for disaster as a communicator. My advice to avoid that problem is for you to stay in your strength zone. When I communicate, I speak and write only in the areas of my strengths. I stick to the eight subjects I know well and can address with excellence. Communication, leadership, equipping, attitude, relationships, success, significance, and faith. These are the things I know and can speak about. My strength zones allow me to have not only knowledge, but also moral authority, because I've proven myself in those areas. What are your strength zones? What do you do best? Where do you possess great skill and natural ability? Where do you demonstrate strong intuition? How have you been best able to help people and add value to them? These are the places you are effective and can be effective with others. The successes of your past will give credibility to your words. Number three, develop your thesis. Robert Frost said, Half the world is composed of people who have something to say and can't, and the other half who have nothing to say and keep on saying it. To help you avoid either fate, you need to develop a thesis for your message. Your thesis is the main thought expressed in a single statement that contains the essence of your message. Every time you intend to communicate through speaking or writing, you should identify your thesis. The hardest people to follow are communicators 
who are searching for their core ideas as they deliver their message. If you don't know what your main point is, how will anyone else? Your thesis is the box top of the puzzle. It describes what the puzzle will look like when it has every piece in place. For example, the thesis of this book is, if you learn and practice the laws of communication, you will become a better communicator. Sometimes I know my thesis before I begin writing. Knowing who my audience is, what they need, and what I can offer them leads me to my thesis. Other times, I follow my intuition. I start doing my research, and I might even start writing my outline before I'm sure of the thesis. Either way, by the time I'm done writing my message, I know what my thesis is. I recommend that you know what yours is, too. Number four, do your research. Your next two steps are doing research and creating an outline. You can do them in either order. But I almost always start with research because it stimulates my thinking and lights the flame of my creativity. Plus, I work faster when I start with something rather than trying to create my outline from scratch. I begin my research by gathering material to support my thesis. I pull together stories, quotes, thoughts, ideas, and illustrations. When I began my career, this was laborious. It's why I started a filing system. Every day I read, find, and save good content. And when I'm ready to write a message, I have hand-picked material waiting for me. Today, there is no end to the amount of material you can access in seconds because of the Internet. So you have a different challenge. It's not finding material. It's finding the right material that not only fits your message, but it also fits you. I encourage you not only to do research for specific talks that you're planning to give, but also continually look for great material that fits your values and style. Capture and record that material using file folders or an electronic system. Your content will only be as good as your research. Number five, write your outline. The other critical part of the message writing process is your outline. This functions as the bones of your speech. The same is true if you're writing a book. A good outline makes your message solid and holds it together. For example, the bones of this book are the 16 laws. They provide the skeleton on which the meat of the book hangs. As a reader, you can look at the book's table of contents and see the bones of the book and judge whether you want to buy and read it. But when you give a speech, people can't see the bones unless you give them a handout or project it on a screen, so you need to make the outline easy for people to listen to and follow. That's one of the reasons I always number my points. I always try to create a sense of continuity and rhythm in the outline so that people can experience a sense of satisfaction as I deliver it and a feeling of completion as I end it. Here are some examples. Thirty years ago, I created a faith-based message called Five Things I Know About People. As I wrote the speech, I played on the word body to give it continuity and make it playful. Some of the points are a bit long, but they worked. Point number one, everybody wants to be somebody. Point two, nobody was created to be a nobody. Point three, everybody can help anybody become a somebody. Point four, anybody who helps somebody becomes a somebody. Point five, God loves everybody and makes each of us somebody. Here's another example. It was a lesson I wrote on success, using rhyme in its points to make it memorable. I taught that success is knowing your purpose in life, growing to your maximum potential, and sowing seeds that benefit others. That outline became the basis of my book, Your Roadmap for Success. Other times, I've used an acrostic to make my points memorable. Here's the outline of a message I created using the words, plan ahead. The letter P, predetermine a course of action. The letter L, lay out your goals. The letter A, adjust your priorities. The letter N, notify key personnel. The letter A, allow time for acceptance. The letter H, head into action. The letter E, 
Expect problems, the letter A, always point to the successes, and the letter D, daily review your plan. I created that message more than 40 years ago, and I can still remember and recite all the points because of the acrostic. As you work on your outline, don't think of it as a set of unrelated points. Make it memorable. A good outline can stand alone, and it has flow. A great outline has a hook that holds the whole thing together and creates a sense of anticipation in listeners that not only makes them think that they know where you're going, but also provides a few surprises in ideas or phrasing along the way. There's really an art to it, but you can master it if you continually work at it and try to improve with each message that you write. Number six, put the body on the bones. In his book, An Experiment in Criticism, novelist, professor, and critic C.S. Lewis wrote, The first demand any work of art makes upon us is surrender. Look, listen, receive. Get yourself out of the way. While he was writing about examining works, his insight also applies to creating them. As we approach the crafting of a message, we must remain open to the possibilities it has when it's delivered. To do this, I approach a message with this three-step thinking. Number one, sense. How has this content affected me? Number two, surrender. This content is not about me, it's about others. Number three, share. How can this content positively affect others? With those ideas in mind, I'm ready to do the hard work of preparing the body of my message. I look at my outline and start fleshing it out, putting what I've researched into place. I illustrate each point with stories, quotes, anecdotes, and information. I add stories from my own life. I move things around as needed. My goal is to create a memorable and moving experience for my audience. B. Joseph Pine II and James H. Gilmore who wrote The Experience Economy, describe the way people process experiences based on whether they are passive or active and whether they absorb the experience or are immersed in it. They describe what they call the four experience realms, entertainment, educational, escapist, and ascetic. Entertainment occurs when people passively absorb the experience 